when the rabbit of chaos is pursued by the ferret of disorder through the fields of anarchy, it is time to hang your pants on the hook of darkness, whether they're clean or not. The headless chicken can only know where he's been. He can't see where he's going. Greetings, friends. Welcome to Critically Acclaimed, episode number six, the movie podcast where we, we review a bunch of movies. Where highbrow and lowbrow collide. I, I know. I wanted to, wanted to shake it up a little bit. Brand, we just got started. The brand right. hasn't sunk in. <laughs> the brand hasn't actually, like, we're like, we're, like sunk into, like, the, the wax of the, wax hasn't, of the internet. It, the wax hasn't dribbled into the carpet of the internet. Yeah, yeah, Roger Moore says a whole bunch of weird stuff in one of the movies we're reviewing this week, and in case you hadn't noticed from that cold open, we're we're kind of enamored of speaking all weird right now. Yes, so we'll we'll, we'll speak however the heck we please. Who are My you? name is Whitney Seibel. Okay. I am a film critic of some stripe. I contribute to the internet ah. and print. It's a good place to be. The inter- well, not right now. No. <laughs> Uh, no, now that net neutrality is gone, invest in books and DVDs, yeah. just in case. I'd say go to a park, but those are being slashed as well. Mm. The world's a depressing place, so why don't why don't you sp- why don't spend a little time with us? We're gonna we're gonna get, review get some, some tea. Actually, we're actually gonna review some really fun movies this week. Uh, so on, every week on Critically Claimed, by the way, I'm William Bibiani. I'm mm-hmm. also a film critic for the internet. Um, and uh, we, every week we review a so-called bad movie that our audience selects for us. It's not always terrible, but it has a reputation for being bad, and we're going to look at that. Whether or not they're bad, they're certainly notorious. Notorious is probably the better yeah. way to look at it. Um, and then we pair it up with a really, really great film that maybe you've heard of or never heard of uh, to create a fun double feature and sort of help expand everyone's uh, knowledge of movies or uh, at the very least give people like a weird counterpoint to think about. The, the the best of the double features, mm. the best of all programmed double features, te- uh, tend to re- make the films reflect on one another, whether or not they have anything to do with each other or not. So you look at them both a different way yeah. once you see them back to back. I remember the one day when I watched Pixar's Up and Drag Me to Hell back to back. Drag Me to Hell first and then Up. And when you think about it, they're both about what happens when you wrong the elderly. Mm. See, there's there's thematic connections if you watch yeah. them. I did have a theory for a while uh-huh. that you could do that with any two films. That's that you put true. any two films together, they would start to color one another, and that is definitely not true. No, but it, it can happen in really unexpected ways. Yes. That's certainly the case. You can certainly mm-hmm. watch a film and then realize, what the... Like when I saw uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, and I realized all of a sudden, oh my god, this is Ice Pirates. Yeah, you like, watch those two back-to-back, yeah, you watch the same movie twice. Yeah, it's, it's like an amazing <laughs> double feature, actually. And I noticed that I feel like Ice Pirates, even in a strange way, Ice Pirates, there's like an element of Ice Pirates in Star Wars The Last Jedi. If you don't know what Ice Pirates is... Um, <laughs> a very strange Star Wars knockoff in the 1980s. From Direct- director Stuart Raffle, who, who we've talked to. Who is one of the weirder filmmakers. He also did Mac and Me, which we're guaranteed to get to at some point on this mm. podcast. And he directed this very odd, very jokey, very uh, uh, willfully eccentric Star Wars knockoff called Ice Pirates, which was about space pirates and they're stealing ice because ice is a valuable commodity in space. And uh, Angelica Houston is in there and she's beheading guys while wearing a leather bikini. Mm. And it's super bizarre and weird. Like every joke in it, it makes like it makes you scratch your head and go, why did they think that was a good idea? Like the the ship they travel around on is infected with uh, with herpes space herpes but but they're like super evolved space herpes so they're like giant creatures that wander around the halls of the yeah, ship so it's like tribbles basically but tribbles are literally space herpes yeah it's a strange premise <laughs> and the climax has a little like time travel twist that i will not reveal no it's so fun but though. it's pretty amazing it's pretty weird if you feel like uh all these like weird like marvel sci-fi stuff like thor ragnarok and guardians of the galaxy oh they're so original they're so interesting watch ice pirates yeah, that's please, where they got please it watch all. the ice that's, pirates that's the that's the tone that's 
that's the jokes. Mm. That's those are those movies. It's really <laughs> weird. Stuart Raffle beat him to it by like thirty years. It's pretty impressive. But uh, I, I digress. Anyway, that's the point of the show. We're also going to be reviewing a whole bunch of new movies, and we're actually going to get well ahead of the game in this episode mm. because uh, we got a couple weeks left to the end of the year. But you and I both want to uh, uh, kick back a little bit, so we we're, uh, we're going to do for our last two episodes of the year. We're going to do uh, in addition to the double feature and uh, the, uh, the series that we're going to review all of the Highlander movies in our last episode of the month, mm. also uh, selected by our fans on uh, Schmoville. Um, we're going to be, the last two episodes are going to be talking about our best uh, movies of 2017, our picks for the best films of the year, and then our picks for the worst films of the year, or possibly mm. vice versa. The, what, should we, what should we do first? We should do best first. We'll do best first. Yeah. Okay, fine. And, and we're worst, you know, while everybody's exhausted from Christmas, mm-hmm. waiting for this year to just end already, yeah. we can look back Here's at Here's why we're the, happy 2017 is over. At the flaming bag of dog crap but, that, that we had to experience. But in the meantime, the we, the we have to review a whole bunch of movies that'll be out during the Christmas season, so... Uh, uh, this week, we're going to be reviewing Star Wars The Last Jedi. We're going to be reviewing it as spoiler-free as humanly possible. Mm. We'll do a spoiler-ridden review on our Patreon page for our other podcasts, Cancel Too Soon, if you really want to listen to that. Uh, but we'll we'll plenty to talk about without getting into the twists and everything. Mm. Uh, we'll also be reviewing Steven Spielberg's The Post, mm. Scott Cooper's new western, Hostiles, Alexander Payne's sci-fi dramedy Downsizing, Beyond Skyline, which exists for some reason, (laughs) uh, Aaron Sorkin's Molly's Game, Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread, Mm -hmm. uh, In the Fade, which I actually don't know a lot about, but it's uh, It's one of the bigger... The German film, yeah, yeah, with Diane Kruger. One of the bigger uh, uh, foreign film uh, breakouts this year, Mm -hmm. everyone's talking about it. And uh, because we're not done with it yet, I'm going to be talking about the Hallmark movie, The Christmas Cottage. So that's nine films we got to cover. So let's get going and uh th- that and that's even like us falling short a little bit like yeah. we didn't get around to seeing the last showman or the uh, greatest showman the greatest yet. showman we didn't get around to seeing jumanji we didn't see jumanji um and listen if there's anything you really don't want to uh listen to a review of we're gonna have a time code in the description of the episode both on youtube and I, i'm pretty sure on itunes on this on the itunes feed uh so you can skip ahead so if you really <laughs> don't want to hear anything about star wars you can skip ahead and we'll we're more talking about the next thing but so. why would you want to skip any of our dulcet tones and our brilliant insight why would you want to skip on star wars there's this interesting mentality i've noticed with mm. star wars where are, are we going to start with star let's wars start with star wars everyone right. wants to talk about it everything ha- has to do with star wars is a spoiler i made the mistake of comparing star wars mm. to a previous star wars movie which i think is fair game i would assume it's fair game just just to say hey the last jedi kind of reminds me of this other star wars movie in its structure and i was told that that's a huge spoiler and you can't say that by well, fans but it, here's my thing uh-huh. i think the irony is that throughout the entire year we're deluged with nothing but star wars and speculation about star wars well and, and not the, just not just speculation but people trying to dig up tiny nuggets of information yeah. about the actual movie like what's in it interviewers try to get the actors to reveal say like, something yeah, meaningful Accidentally yeah. reveal something about the plot, and it's an ironic. Culture. And then, like maybe f- three or four days before the release of the film, all of that like just turns off immediately. It's like, okay, we don't want information. We want to see it blind. I'm like, then like, you probably shouldn't well, have clicked then, on all that Star Wars stuff. Yeah, so, but then why are you like putting together all of these previews that put together all of the footage from all the international previews? So you have like 20 minutes of the film already. And on top of that, I feel like a lot of that speculation, like people, oh, we just like to speculate. We don't like to know the actual information. But then when a movie like The Last Jedi comes around, and I'm going to get The Last Jedi, mm-hmm. I have some, I have some critiques of The Last Jedi, but I actually yeah. really, really like this movie. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that it does really well is it sets you up for one thing and then it subverts it and it gives you something that you didn't expect to see in the Star Wars movie okay. I think and um, I think as a result I think it's going to people who got really invested in their speculations are going to be surprised maybe mm-hmm. they're going to like their fan theory even better and that kind of <laughs> sets you up for a downfall and it gives the movie like this unrealistic standard well that, that's fan theory that's not not anything that's in the movie you I know but just we... let, let the movie say what it has to say and I, not I... really worry about the filmmakers who are making these things aren't coming at it from the same angle you are as a fan. They may be fans of Star uh, Wars. They probably are. They probably are. Yeah. Maybe not. Who's to say? They're probably J.J. You know, Abrams wasn't a big Trek guy before he started making Trek movies. Fair enough. Uh, and you can tell. Uh, <laughs> But they're here to sort of look at Star Wars and try to see what kind of stories they can dig out of it. They're not looking back at Star Wars and re-watching it every day and trying to 
uh, expound on sort of theories that are being cycled around the internet. They're not on the news groups. Yeah. They're not sharing tweets. And they shouldn't be. They should yeah. be trying to make sure it's it's surprising and organic mm-hmm. and um, not something that you came up with the second you got out of The Force Awakens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think that's, I think that's the case. So you think some people are upset because... I think the filmmakers aren't doing that. I think there's there is a there is an idea that the Force Awakens was sort of too similar to the original Star Wars, and it's an yeah. argue, and I think it's a fair observation mm. that it's obviously uh, using what we had seen before and sort of no, I wouldn't say even recycling it, but certainly putting it as part of a cycle mm. where uh, all of these things will happen before, all these things will happen again. It's a generational tale, and or, we'll never learn from our mistakes. Or they just knew there's only a, a few limited ways you can make a Star Wars movie, so I think they just went. Back I, it, so. I think that's not true, and I think we've actually kind of I think the last Jedi well, is actually it's not, playing with that. It's, but. it's not true, but that seems to be what they thought. Certainly, I think that's certainly an argument to be made for that. But then The Last Jedi comes around and they're trying to do something. They're trying to stretch it a bit. They're trying to make it look different, feel different, play differently, do some uh, story elements that hadn't been done before in the franchise. Mm. And I think some people are rejecting that, which basically shows me that uh, it's pretty evenly divided. But it's Star Wars. People are going to see it and talk about it and make it part of their personal canon no matter what. So, filmmakers, if you're making a Star Wars movie, just make the movie you want. D- do whatever. Just make the movie you want whatever, and we'll yeah. deal with it and it's Star Wars and it'll be fine. <laughs> Worst case scenario, you'll make an Ewok movie and in 30 years everyone will pretend it never happened. <laughs> uh, my, my favorite uh, is people say, okay, I'm going to rank all the Star Wars movies. All the Star Wars movies. Okay, here's one through eight. Okay, what about that animated film that was released? Okay, that doesn't count. Okay. Okay, what about those those two like TV movies with the Ewoks? That were released theatrically were, internationally. Released those are real the, releases. Yeah, so, so those yeah. have theatrical releases. What about those? Oh, those don't count. What about the holiday special? That's canon. That's a feature-length story mm-hmm. that is live action, features the cast of Star Wars, mm-hmm. and was originally canon. And, is, and was signed off on by George Lucas. I don't care for the idea that, oh, they're not in continuity anymore, therefore they don't exist. That's like saying we'll, ne- we'll never really release any of the James Bond films before Daniel Craig came in mm. because that was a retcon. Or like, oh yeah, <laughs> John Carpenter's Halloween? Bullshit. We're never going to release it again. Mm. Rob Zombie rebooted it. That's the only thing that counts. The reboot doesn't get to own anything. In fact, the reboot does it has <laughs> less less uh, claim to the throne, as it were. Oh, sorry, uh, well, arguably. I think, but I think the point is that these are real movies. And mm. they, whether you like them or not, whether they're canonical or not, they're real movies <laughs> they're and they real, should be treated as such. They're real Star Wars movies. And I think yeah. what a lot of Star Wars fans uh, t- tend to very forcefully ignore, forcefully, ha! Uh, <laughs> uh, is that this series has a bad track record. Well, Star Wars is quite spotty, a good, is spotty at best. Uh, Star Wars is quite a good film. Uh, I, think the first, I think the first trilogy is great. I think there are some issues with Return mm. of the Jedi in particular. Well, let, I think they're great. So we have Star Wars. Then we yeah. have the holiday special, which is kind of, of the, almost cancels out Star Wars. <laughs> I would say it's, it's one of the worst things. Yeah, it is just in general. Really, then Empire Strikes Back about, and everybody's still masturbating to that movie. So <laughs> classy, real classy. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, it's a great movie. It's it's a it's, it's a very good movie. <laughs> Whitney Whitney prefers the original Star. Wars. I prefer the original Star Wars. I, I know I'm mm. in the minority there. Um, Return of the Jedi is still being debated to this day, even though it came out in 1983. I think the good outweighs the bad. I think it's a lot of cool visual stuff but that's production design and the actual storytelling is really kind of shoddy in that one and there's not much going on at the end there I think all it boils down to is everything at Jabba's Palace is pretty fucking awesome and the final confrontation between Luke the Emperor and Darth Vader is pretty fucking glorious but but why? Luke, why? What are you, the, talk, what are you talking the, about? Fucking why? The Emperor says, join the dark side. And Luke says, no, I don't want to. There's nothing there for, for Luke. Why Luke, Luke is confronting to... his father who became who he, fucking who evil. Who he just met. He has nothing in, invested in it's his, his father. It's his legacy. It's his, his father. I mean, his father destroyed found... His father destroyed thousands of years of democracy and committed mm. genocide. And he has to deal with that. Mm. It is his responsibility. He's the only person in the galaxy who's like powerful enough to physically confront Darth Vader and yet Darth Vader is his father Mm. and he's manipulating him like there's a lot going on in that and it's fucking great okay if you say so Ah. (laughs) it's alright it's alright alright fine 
Then we have um, the Ewok movies. Then we have the two Ewok movies, which came out on TV in U- in the U.S. Yeah, and, and those the, those are strange. The first one's not very good. The second one plays pretty well, actually. It's, it's, it's weird, but there's the some second, really neat second stuff ones in. with like the Dark Wizard and the castle, and yeah, yeah. Wilford Brimley and like yeah. and like uh, Wicket, the Ewok played by Warwick Davis, learns to speak English and builds a hang glider out of skeletons, and <laughs> like it's it's a weird movie, but there's a lot of well, neat stuff in it. There, it's actually. Although the production value is very low compared to the other Star Wars films. They look pretty good for the era. They look pretty good for the era. And I th- the story elements and the kind of stuff in there is something you might see in a Star Wars film. You know, evil wizards and all the rest. Yeah, they, they definitely play more towards the sort of magical quotient than the sci-fi quotient, yeah. I think. Um, which a lot of people is find really odd but like yeah they're, they're kind of neat and, and certainly the visual effects work is pretty impressive mm-hmm. for both it, it, and it again, gave them a chance to shoot in the woods and save a little go. bit of money but I, I would say Battle for Endor mm-hmm. is definitely worth seeking out at some point if yeah. only because um, would you call it a great movie no though? god no but it's entertaining <laughs> okay. it's about as good yeah. as like it's it's like just around hovering around Krull like it's that, hovering yeah, around that, Krull it's, I would say Krull's, Krull's a little better but Krull's orbit <laughs> yeah like it's it's there you go. Uh, then there were, uh, we waited, I guess time. that was like 86 that TV movie came out? 85, I think was the last 86. one. Yeah. And then it wasn't until 99 that we got another Star Wars feature. Yeah, we had the special editions, obviously, which changed yeah. a bunch of things, but basically the same films. I, but, I don't think they're as good as the originals, but whatever. But then, then we had uh, Star Wars The Phantom Menace and, and its two sequels, and... There's a lot of apologists not, for those now, but not they're not well-constructed yeah. films. We can't... We can't reveal anything new about these movies that haven't been said by thousands of internet pundits. Yeah, some are better than others, but I don't think any of them are nearly as good as the original They trilogy. are all equal. <laughs> they, no, they, they're not. They look no, and they feel not. the there same. Are, there are actual moments uh, in, Re- in Revenge of the Sith mm. that are successful. That mm. actually are pretty good. There's some good moments, some good action. The final, like, There's some good final confrontations there. There's a sense of portent. Mm. There's some child murders, which is nice. Well, but. Sure, classy. But like, I think I think there's stuff that works in Revenge of the Sith. I think it is let down by the stuff that doesn't work in Revenge of the Sith. All the incredible amount of stuff that doesn't work in Attack of the Clones, which is basically everything but Ewan McGregor, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> like, his whole bit is pretty good, and then everything else in that movie is just mm. death to me. And then Phantom Menace is... I, I almost like... I honestly don't even know how to respond to Phantom Menace anymore. It's this weird experiment mm. that I don't think worked. But I can't help but admire like the the audacity of some of it it did influence filmmaking more than we tend to give it credit for in terms of moving to a digital realm shooting on like he shot it largely on film but partly on digital Mm -hmm. from what i understand some of the sets were still practical but Mm -hmm. he was moving pushing more and more toward shooting on green screens and i think all of attack of the clones was shot on green screens or at least most of it yeah and so there were no sets a lot of the characters were cgi and i think it was the first film i ever saw projected digitally uh for a lot of people yeah or maybe I saw like Ocean's Eleven or, or that really horrible Bob Dylan film, Mask and Anonymous. I saw those perhaps before. Right. But this was when digital projection wasn't that great. Digital mm-hmm. photography wasn't that great. So it was a butt ugly film as well. Yeah. So anyway, a and lot then, of those movies are, are, are not very good. And then we had the Star Wars Clone Wars animated movie. And say what you will about the show, the movie wasn't a good introduction no. to it. And so, then, so let's review. Yeah. A lot of those are not good movies. <laughs> Two pretty good movies. One you like. One, one that's one three that's good movie. Three generally considered to be good movies. All right. We can go with that. The original trilogy so generally considered to be pretty rock solid. Three good movies. Uh, six bad ones so far. <laughs> Okay. That are thereabouts, and then and then we're still debating Force Awakens. Force Awakens we're still is debating one Rogue One. Debated. Force Awakens, I think, is fine. I, I mean, like I, Rogue Force Awakens grows in my estimation over time. Rogue One lowers in my estimation over yeah. time. Rogue One, I hated at the time and don't like anymore now. Yeah, I, I enjoy Rogue One well enough as an action movie, but I don't think it's a particularly potent Star Wars movie. Right. I know it's got that huge doom and gloom ending, but I think it's unique because they didn't set up the characters very well. I only feel something. Something like that because I haven't seen that ending in a Star Wars movie before. <laughs> I think it's, I, I find it a little grossly manipulative. But I, well, I think Rogue One's problem is is it, essentially it's IP. It didn't mm. bother doing anything. It just threw a bunch of Star Wars stuff in a movie. I think that's an exaggeration. Well, I mean, if if the characters weren't connected to Star Wars and you'd like it, it wouldn't be able to uh, pass muster. Like that's th- fair, those yeah. characters would all be really, really boring and dull either way. 
they're they're boring and dull, and I think a lot of people are willing to give it a pass because it connects to Star Wars. Because it has context, because we're already yeah. emotionally invested with a few of the minor characters, mm. and of course the MacGuffin, which is end up being the same MacGuffin in New Hope. Mm. Um, so anyway, so here we are, and again, uh, we're going to try to keep this as spoiler free as we can, but we're going to have to talk about how it plays so uh, if you really want to avoid everything we have like time codes in the description of the episode on iTunes on the SK Plus YouTube channel Um, if you feel like we're delving too much into it and you don't want to know anymore there's your guide and you can move on from there The Last Jedi uh, mm-hmm. Directed by Ryan Johnson, uh, joining Rit- the franchise Rit- for the first and time. Directed. That's, That's the, right. f- the first time in this series history since mm-hmm. George Lucas. Well, that we've had the same person writing and directing. Well, J.J. Uh, Abrams co-wrote uh, uh, Force Awakens, but Ryan, Ryan Johnson is the only credited writer on this one. Is, is he really? Okay, well, yeah. fine. Um, and he's got a lot to pick up. A lot of pieces, a lot of characters, um, mm-hmm. and. I feel like, okay, so here's what we're going to say right now about spoiler-wise. We have to talk about some parts of the movie. We're going to talk about what happens in the movie. We're the not going basic to give away... Plot, we're not going to stay away from any, twists and a lot of stuff in the second half. Any big surprises. Um, I will say this. I feel like with Star Wars Episode Eight mm. that we got Star Wars Episode Eight and Nine both at once. Because yeah, a, they really... a lot happens in this movie. I to thought the, point, the movie was over. We had like half exhaustion. the movie left. Yeah, like... like Everything was kind of drawing to a close at a point yeah. in the movie. It's like okay, and uh, all there's, the everything's kind of coming together. There's, there's a huge big, climax. There's, there's big climaxes and confrontations, and a big resolution to that. And it's like okay, and credit. And I looked at my watch and realized there's an hour to go in this yeah. film. This is a two and a half hour film. Say it's what like, you will, they gave you your money's worth. I, my d- God, that's but, a lot of Star Wars. But, in this. but j- after after that, I guess first climax. <laughs> And they and then there's like I think two or three additional climaxes yeah. beyond that. I I, I just I kind of shut down. It's, it's kind like, of exhausting. I I can't feel excited after that. So I, it's, so it's, I felt like I, like in the second half of the Last Jedi, it's like okay, maybe this is significant or not, but I'm not feeling any sort of thrill watching it happen. I'm just sort of kind of waiting for it to see where it's going to head with I, all of I feel this. like the structure of The Last Jedi is really interesting to me because I feel like in, in a very basic way, mm. just in a very basic framework, it's structured quite a bit like Empire Strikes Back. The characters well, yeah, are, hold yeah, on, yeah. the characters are split up. Mm. So you have Rey meeting with an old Jedi master. This time it's it's Luke Skywalker, not mm. Yoda, um, in a very verdant area, mm. learning about the Force, confronting the Force, um, it's confronting herself, doubt, uh, mm-hmm. all that stuff. All that stuff is is pretty parallel. Uh-huh. Uh, then we've got uh, the rebellion on the run from basically the Empire. The I know Empire. it's the First Order, but it's the Empire. That's, um, uh, this is all Tiny Toons correlations. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you got all of that. So the the heroes are on the run, uh, and uh, there's also got to be like a, a a mission to a a new locale. Very uh, uh, affluent locale where it seems like everything is above board, but it turns out it's not. Mm -hmm. And then you set all that up, and then about halfway through the movie, it just splits off. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, it just does not go where Empire goes. In fact, there's one bit where I feel like they literally do the opposite of what Empire did, and I think it's pretty cool. Oh, well, uh, now that that's in place, we talk about what what actually happened in the movie. So, Mm -hmm. Rey is on this island, she's learning about the Force. Just, just like like an empire, uh, Yoda had like things of wisdom to say and kind of defined the Force and these kind of very beatific things, and, and it was really kind of slowly paced. I feel like Ryan Johnson doesn't know how to do like slow and contemplative because there are scenes where they're just sort of walking around the island, and for some reason, John Williams is like scoring this as if like it's Sound of Music. Yeah, like, like the camera zooms in, they're about to start singing, the well, hills are alive, and I, I feel like. To contrast all of the stuff on the run, that these scenes needed to be a lot quieter. Well, so it's interesting that's, that's because a, that's, a, that's a little quibble right there. Well, because I think what happens is, like, if um, you look at in Empire when Luke is with Yoda, mm. Luke doesn't know he has somewhere else to be right now. Mm. Ray is there for a reason. Ray is there to bring Luke back so that he can bring, uh, uh, he can basically be a figurehead and help right. inspire people to join the rebellion because the Jedi have disappeared and Luke Skywalker is this legendary figure who can once again the last Jedi. In fact, he's, that's basically mm. what that means. Mm. Um, and so she's so she's like gonna t- got a ticking clock. So it already has like a more intensity mm. than it would. The other thing I like is that Luke doesn't want to fucking teach her. Yeah. He literally does not want to. So there's like this whole bit, like he trains her, but really begrudgingly. 
Um, and that creates like a totally different vibe. This is not peaceful. This is not trying to create an environment where she will become a great Jedi. This is Luke trying to be left alone. Uh-huh. And I don't want to ruin this moment, for, even though it's like one of the first things in the movie. But like the resolution to Ray at the end of Force Awakens handing Luke the lightsaber uh-huh. is perfect. It pays off very well. It's such a great moment. Uh-huh. I, I love everything. It's not even what I, I – there were ways I thought that would go. Not what, not what they did. I, you know, there's like a couple of things – I had in my head about, like, say, Snoke or who Ray's parents are. Um, that Wait, was, th- was that a thing? Oh, I, yeah. I was not paying attention because oh, yeah. I have nothing invested in this series. No, no, no. Like, but everyone I, thought it was I a was... big deal. Who's Ray, who are Ray's parents going to be? But they never brought up her parents not in the first Not particularly. They, she was, they, she weren't, they weren't significant. She so... didn't know who they were. There's a All lot right. of really vague bits in The Force Awakens where, like, Maz Kanata says, so, who's the girl? And then they cut away. And mm-hmm. everyone's like, oh, that means they're having a long conversation about who Ray is. And she's someone really, really important i'm like not necessarily she they could have just cut oh, away geez. because we don't need to introduce her again okay, okay. so people stop, build it up a lot stop looking so close <laughs> so, so there's a lot of stories about like snoke or ray or yeah. phasma or whatever that people built up a lot and at least one of those things doesn't go in the big direction and i love that i love that there's actually bits of this that are just like hey Mm. It's not not everything's important, man. Mm. Not everything is a big fucking yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah. Like it's some some of some of it's just stuff that happens, mm. and I'm like, yay, good. Um, she does have a kind of moment of catharsis uh, on this like mysterious Icelandic island, mm-hmm. uh, which takes place in an oubliette, which uh, like this big dark mossy cave, which makes it the second film I've seen this year that has a big emotional catharsis in an oubliette following Coco. Oh, okay, there you go. So, yeah, so all we need is a third film and we have a tr- an oubliette trend. People like oubliettes? Ever since say. First Night? <laughs> first Night, we introduced the oubliette into the pop culture canon and mm-hmm. now everyone's got to have an oubliette. That, it was we're, weird. We're, we're digging one in our backyard today. It was weird when they put it in Never Been Kissed, but somehow they made it work. <laughs> <laughs> we fell into this mossy cave. Um, How romantic. So all that stuff with Ray, I'm going to be honest, I think Mark Hamill is really, really great. All the stuff about um, trying to sort of, are we burying the past? Are we uh, sort of reviving the past? Uh, all of that stuff is actually really, really great. And there's some really good emotional moments that I really don't want to reveal on that island that really hit me, like, real hard. I'm like, that's eh, well done, all Star right. Wars. There's some good bits. Meanwhile, uh, there's also... The rebels are on the run from the First Order, and in order to escape and save the rebellion, because it's basically it. It's a couple yeah. of ships left. This is it. If, this, if these people die, that's all there is. The rebe- they're they, literally they being it, chased. They call it something different, but it's still a rebellion. Right? The resistance, yeah. whatever. Yeah. We are the resisti. Um, it's an Invader Zim reference. Well, um, the, the resistance. And notice, did you notice that they made Domhnall Gleeson's character look a lot like Donald Trump? <laughs> like okay. they changed his hair and eyebrows? I'm going to say it right now. I, I love Domhnall Gleeson in this movie because he's really, really funny. Mm. At the same time, I feel like they made him too funny. Like I feel like well, he's... I, he, he, they took the Domhnall Gleeson version from like whatever new version of Spaceballs Mel Brooks is doing. And they brought the Spaceballs version in and they yeah. didn't think we'd notice. Because he's just comic relief in this film. He, he really is. And... In his first scenes, he's standing on the the bridge, you know, barking out orders, and I like half expected like a custard pie to hit him in the face. Yeah, like it has that tone, really cartoonish. And indeed, this movie uh, has like these tiny moments of levity throughout, to the point of like kind of interrupting a lot of their more intense scenes. Yeah, it's an odd tone. I actually like I'm like Ray, to... Ray is like, tell me about the force. Okay, here's about the force. Oh, so floating rocks, joke. <laughs> it's like no. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down a little bit. There's a weird... There's Every once in a while, there are like these weird gags where it felt like Ryan Johnson got bored and started amusing himself while he was writing it. Yeah. And, they just, and the joke just f- filtered into the movie just with no one going, this is kind of out of place. There's a bit later on with a new droid that we've never seen before. And all of the shots of this other droid are make it seem like it's got its own really important subplot going. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, really, yeah. Like I don't they, want to ruin how it happens. They filmed it happens. badly. But but I, yeah. I think they filmed it really well because I think it's really funny funny like i kind of want to see that all the deleted scenes that's actually just this whole movie from that droid's perspective <laughs> as if that droid was doing like another bb8 like it just like the, it's 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 horse the hate bug version of bb8 <laughs> is what it know. is if you don't know what the hell we're talking about there is one of the herbie movies went straight to v, uh, straight to tv starred bruce campbell and they introduced herbie the love bugs arch nemesis horace the hate bug yes yeah, there, there's great. An, an, an evil bug in the yeah. <laughs> it's Horus. It's pretty fantastic. Um, so we anyway, got so we, so we have all of this stuff with Ray and Luke and their 
she, she's trying to get him to go back. All that story. And meanwhile, uh, the the resistance is fleeing. Yeah, the bad guys have found a way to track them through light speed. Which, by which the way, evidently is, is something that can't be done in Star Wars. Which is basically the second episode of Battlestar Galactica. Like it's really <laughs> like very specifically Battlestar Galactica. And that was uh, interesting. this is the first time in all of Star Wars where we get a little clearer idea as to how these ships work. Uh, what the technology level is and how the command structure actually functions. I'm going to throw it out there right now. Mm. There's a ton of that, but it's all in the ancillary material. Well, I mean, but not I, in the, not in in the, the movies, movies. There's not a lot of detail. I'll give yeah. you that. But like, if you read the books, there are schematics. There's all kinds of crazy Well, I, I know there's all kinds of expanded universe stuff. And I'm, I'm sure I could find an expanded universe thing that a fan or just somebody could, vaguely connected to Star Wars could explain to me how this, the command structure works, yeah. how a lightsaber actually works. But we really but get tra- into the meat of Star- it. Star Wars has never been about the tech. That's always been Star Trek's realm. Yeah. And now that Star Trek is trying to be like Star Wars, <laughs> Star Wars is turning around and saying, well, we're going to start explaining tech to you. Isn't that nice? I and you know what? I appreciate that because I always liked that about Honestly, Star Trek. Honestly, most of the, re- the Rebel subplot, like not Ray and Luke, but all the stuff with Poe Dameron and Finn and this new character, Rose, who I like a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of that stuff feels more Star Trek-y. You're right. It's yeah. about solving specific problems. Mm. It is about principle and uh, uh, standing in the face of oppression. Well, and, and they're really just it's talking a, about it in a more intelligent and mature way. It's also about two people with different command levels coming up with different... E- equally workable solutions to the same problem yeah. and coming to blows over it. That's a Star Trek episode right it there. It totally is. So Lord Dern ends up yeah. like basically in charge for a while and Poe Dameron has no faith in her plan so he comes up with another plan mm. with Finn and this new character Rose which who involves is, uh, breaking onto uh, the Empire ship and in order to do so they have to like find help and go to a casino planet they to have, find They have help. to find a hacker and they go to a casino planet to find a hacker. Yeah. Um, all it, of this it, stuff uh, is... Now if most of the, the film had taken place on that planet, I would have been fine. <laughs> so you're the, okay, so a lot of people who actually are, are sort of critiquing that section. Okay. Not because, I, don't, I think it's actually fun. I think it's a mm. fun bit. I think it works. I like that we're sort of illuminating different parts of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because honestly, most of the other worlds that we've seen, with the exception of some of the stuff in the prequels, but I'm talking about like the post-Empire, um has been mostly about uh, poorer communities, poorer classes, criminal underworlds. Mm. And here we're seeing, here's what the 1% essentially is like Uh in in a post-Empire, First Order, Star Wars universe. And there are some ugly parallels to what we're doing today. And I actually appreciated that it got a little political, and I actually really liked that. However... It it, it got a little political, but it it backed off. Like, it brought up a political point and then didn't explore it. And I think they didn't need to explore it that much. They just need to have it in there, basically. I I I, I would have appreciated it more than than a single line. But then it becomes exactly Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) What I want is Star Trek. (laughs) It is what you want. Um, But I will say this. There's there's a way that the story plays out. I'm not going to ruin it for you. We're basically all of the Finn and Rose and Poe stuff kind of ends up feeling like you could have taken it out of the movie and yeah. the movie would have been fine and well, you didn't it, really need it I, I guess I was, weird. I guess I was tantalized by it that I wish they had sort of followed through with that that particular storyline rather yeah. than sort of skewing it and doing what they did. Well, when you do, um, when you, I don't want to say what happens, but when you, yeah. when you bifurcate a movie this much mm. and you make it like half of the movie is this thing, half of this movie is this thing, mm. you run the risk of one half being more interesting than the other. And part of that might just be personal preference. Yeah. I think, you know, you could say like, Oh, I like the Han Solo Leia stuff better in empire than I like the Luke and, and Yoda stuff. Mm. But you know, if you differentiate it enough and if they manage to run parallel to each other, you can really find a, a good sweet spot. And I think there are parts of The Last Jedi where there's a really, really good sweet spot and where I'm actually mm. like really invested in both things happening. Yeah. I like all the characters. The action oh. is exciting. And then, uh, yeah, they're about eh, halfway through, maybe a little further, someone makes a decision to mm. do something that wouldn't have happened in the other trilogies. And, <laughs> I, and it's, it's basically we're going to learn from a previous mistake. We're going to try something different. Mm. And they do. And there's a lot of cool stuff that happens as a result of it. 
And there's also a lot of stuff that feels kind of chaotic and maybe unstructured yeah, because of yeah. it. And so as a result, I'm part of me is really tantalized and excited and very interesting to see where we go from here. Because seriously, the next movie could be anything. Um, well, or like, like I said, we got eight and nine already. Yeah. It feels like the series is done. Like <laughs> you could have ended it here. Like wh- if there was not an episode it, nine, it'd be fine. Wouldn't it be great if that was the big bait and switch? Like they're going to say, okay, details, details. There's going to be a big announcement about episode nine. Again, and the press all gathers around. And everybody's on the internet, and JJ Abrams stands up and says. No, episode nine. We did it. Yeah. We're done. <laughs> because there's a lot. Listen, it's not like they wrap everything up. It's not like everyone dies or anything like that. But there's a really they, satisfying they cl- they conclusion close to it off. And you know what? Yeah. I, without saying anything about the ending, I will say I was so satisfied with this ending because so many of the big blockbusters I watch these days are all part of these big series that are announced to go on indefinitely. Yeah. And as a result, no matter how unique or closed off they might be unto themselves, there's always a teaser. And there's always this nagging feeling that I'm watching a commercial for the next one yeah. rather than enjoying the film I'm seeing now. Like, I need to be taking notes of what's going on here so I can mm. remember that for later on. Here's an installment Here's, of Star Wars that you can just play on its own. The, like, you might need to know what happened in the previous installment right. to kind of get your bearings a little bit better But it here. doesn't feel like they're saving anything for the trip back. No, no, no. They're, they're yeah. really just t- finishing this story. And I feel like we're kind of done with this little arc here. And yeah. I don't know and exactly could, what we can do. They could going start forward. something else up. There's a few things left over that obviously fact, are, aren't resolved, but like it feels like a lot of character arcs come a, to a meaningful conclusion. And there's, and we a, get to... there's a sentiment not only of the filmmakers, but it's actually stated aloud in the film of essentially trying to wipe the slate a little bit. Yeah. Trying to, you know what? We've had the same kind of Star Wars for a long time. Let's just put it all behind us and yeah. try to find something new to do with Star Wars. And that they actually said that aloud in a Star Wars film was very, very refreshing. There's a, there's a sentiment here where like a next generation is supposed to be better than the generation that preceded it. Mm. And that's very pointed for Star Wars because in Star Wars, we look back at the previous generation, particularly the first generation of Star Wars episodes four through six, you know, mm. Star Wars through Jedi. Um, and there's a lot of, there's so much affection that we we're hesitant to move on. We're yeah. hesitant to move past it. And here's a movie that's saying we literally need to. Yeah. <laughs> and and honestly, like all those characters that we love so much, no. they had a lot of growing up to do too. It came so late in the film. I sense that Ryan Johnson was like, it's like, okay, right. And what do I do with Star? Wars? I'm just, I'm getting tired of writing this. Wait, I have an idea. <laughs> I'm going to do the last thing anyone expects. Yes. And it's it. Listen, there's some. Here's what I'm going to say about it, the it, last... No, it's, it's not as dramatic as I've heard people's. It's like, it's so daring and takes Star Wars in such a new... Well, not really, if you're, but... Yeah, no, I think it is. I think if you really are invested in Star Wars, specifically mm. Star Wars, you live and breathe it, you've seen it a whole bunch of times, I think you get used to kind of the rhythms of it. Mm. And I think th- this movie breaks a lot of those rhythms while making you think it's going to play ball, while making you think it's mm, going right. to play by the other rules. And I don't think it breaks everything. I don't think it's a huge, dramatic shift. I don't think this is like, oh, this is like nothing you've ever seen. Of course not. Mm. Uh, however, I think this does take some bold choices. I think it makes some very striking choices, some very deliberate choices. This doesn't feel like it's hedging its bets and trying to give you something you've seen before. I feel like they're trying to give you something that feels like what you've seen before and then do something different. And I admire that. There's so many scenes in this movie that work really, really great. Mm. There's so many characters in this movie that work really, really great. There's also a lot of characters who feel underwritten or extraneous or mm. feel like they should have had more screen time, and that's frustrating. Uh, the- There's a couple of plot holes that drive me up the wall. And mm. the exact ending of the movie, and I really can't get into this in any detail, unfortunately, there's an element of it like thematically uh-huh. that I think undercuts the kind of beautiful statement it's trying to make. Mm. But we'll talk about that in a spoiler that thing spoiler. elsewhere because um, there's no way to get into it otherwise. But I do think for the most part... I was pretty riveted throughout a lot of this movie. I think it's a little clunky at times, mm. but I think it's clunky because it's ambitious, and I admire that. Yeah. Um, Star Wars, is, you know, these are always have always been, with the exception of the very first, uh, kind of big A productions. They're slick. Mm-hmm. There's no cracks in them. I think that's why I like Star Wars more than anything. They're, it's a little bit shabby, and I, I appreciate that quality and to I'll, it. And I'll even correct you there. I but, think the first one, though mm-hmm. not considered an A production at the time, I think everyone on board treated it like an A production. Yeah. They gave it the extra mile, and that's what made it great. They could have but, done. They could have half-assed mm-hmm. the sound design, and instead they reinvented sound design. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's all about attitude. But... Uh, Ever since then, we've like dumped huge amounts of money into these things, and they have this kind of shiny, confectionery look and feel to them, uh, which makes them all feel really similar to somebody like me, who's not on message boards and not sort of memorizing the details. So... Mm. 
functionally, The Last Jedi l- looks and feels identical to uh, The Force Awakens. It, it's just sort of a good, really solid, efficient pop filmmaking that might exhilarate you or excite you, but isn't really transcending much in the way of what filmmaking can do. Oh, not what filmmaking um, can do, obviously. Yeah, I'm not going to so, pretend that. I think, I think so it's the, pretty the Earth, bold in Star Wars. I, I think Star Wars, like, the Earth can't really be moved by Star Wars anymore. It already happened, and now we're just sort of riding on the wave that it cre- created, you know, decades ago. Right. Uh, so I, I walked out feeling really exhausted. Because I feel like I'm watching two or three movies at the same time. and uh, But at the same time, enjoying myself and kind of having a pretty good day at the movies without really yeah. thinking too much about it. Well, I, I disagree with a lot of what you said in terms of like the level on which it works. Mm-hmm. But I, I think we're both on the same page. I think this is, an, this is a pretty solid popcorn movie i think if you're really invested in star wars i think it's gonna i think it's gonna surprise you at times mm. um i think you're gonna take away some really great bits and i think if you're paying attention you're gonna see some problems now let's move on to something that's harder to spoil because it's history <laughs> we can spoil history yeah uh, watch the, us try steven spielberg's the post is the latest in his all right kids let me tell you a little story about the 21st century cycle um <laughs> uh, which includes such films as uh munich and bridge of spies and Oh, um, I would, oh, just American history, Lincoln. I, w- I would say that The Post bears more in common with Lincoln than any of his previous films, in that he is using the pa- uh, political struggle of the past to highlight very sharply a political struggle of the present. Exacto mundo. Uh, so Lincoln was about the pa- passing of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, but you could see that it was also a, a metaphor for civil rights of gay people. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a lot of parallels, and it was very yeah. clear. It, like it was around the same time as we were passing uh, gay a lot marriage of, legislation going through the Supreme yeah, Court, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I think there was this idea in everyone's oh. heads at the time of the passing of the Thirteenth Amendment. Not everyone's ideas, but mm. I think there's a, a sort of very vague sense of American history a lot of people have, in which they think it was all kind of official and stentorian, and they don't realize just how very much like today, like how, uh, how po- po- the way politics played, how and many the infighting de- deals and the, have to be made. Yeah. And infighting and people who don't want it for various reasons and yeah and how easy and how easily it could the we the absolute obvious histo- history declares it right thing to do mm. people were talking themselves out of doing it yeah and yeah. that was a really potent thing to and explore. uh I've I've heard the post now described as the first major Hollywood release that is a direct reaction to Donald Trump. I think that's fair because this takes place uh, during the time of the Pentagon Papers. This was pre Watergate Nixon administration during the Vietnam War uh, when some details started to leak out to the public via hardworking uh, reporters that we were fighting the Vietnam War for reasons that we weren't being told about. Yeah, the Pentagon Papers are not as well, or not as frequently discussed as the Watergate scandal. I think a lot of people have a pretty basic handle on the Watergate scandal. Yeah. Depending on papers, I think some people might be a little looser about. Basically, the uh, the administration had commissioned a study, a very clear uh, sort of uh, history of everything they did in the Vietnam War, building up to the Vietnam War, all the decisions like, that like they a, made behind the scenes. In the many, like many administrations leading before the Vietnam War, there was Absolutely. all this talk about invading Vietnam. Including the stuff that was unethical or illegal mm. or flat-out espionage. Um, and the, the, the revealed the Pentagon Papers revealed that America knew the Vietnam War was a lost cause many years before the Pentagon Papers leaked, mm. and that a lot of American soldiers who died over there really didn't need to. Mm. And that was a huge scandal. Now, what happened was the New York Times got their hands on some of those papers. Mm. They did their research. They put out uh, a, a couple of articles. And then the Nixon administration put a halt on that, saying it was jeopardizing national security, and they can't pu- they can't publish that. And the Washington Post managed well, to get I'll- their hands on it right afterwards. And then there was like, well, screw it. We'll publish it. Yeah, well, it... The movie is about that "screw it, we'll publish" moment. And yeah, in it's fact, basically that day for uh, the most part. <laughs> and there's a lot of it's a the drama about what the post had to go through. And uh, the post is being uh, edited by uh, Tom Hanks' character, and it's being run by Meryl Streep's character. She's yeah. like the owner; she inherited it, and she's she doesn't get a lot of respect because she's the first woman to own a newspaper in history. And it's a really incredible role because she's really at this interesting sort of flashpoint. She, her father owned the mm-hmm. paper. Then he died, and he left it to her husband. 
Uh-huh. And then her husband committed suicide, and only now does she own it. Yeah. And she's she's an older woman, and everyone's still walking. There's just kind of walking circles around her, talking about her like she's not in the room. There's a scene where the publisher of the New York Times is in a room <laughs> with a whole bunch of like politicians and reporters. Mm-hmm. And when dinner is over, she is expected to go hang out with the women and talk about fineries while men talk about politics. Yeah. There, and it's there's a, a, amazing to watch. There's a a really terrific shot where she's walking to a dinner and like her aides are behind her and they're talking about business and she opens a door and every person in the room turns to face her and it's all these tall guy like tall white guys in suits it's like and she enters this world of men it's this great visual metaphor yeah and it's like, Spielberg, it's like the elevator scene in The Silence of the Lambs. You Steven know? Spielberg is not a director who's uh, uh, fond of subtle visual. <laughs> Definitely not. If you go into this expecting all the president's men where it's very much just you are there like kind of drama. and steely. He yeah. is telling you a story. He is putting the flashlight under his face at a campfire. He is making sure you know that although this ultimately is a story about a bunch of people deciding whether or not to publish an article. Mm. He really wants you to know that this is a tipping point. This is an important moment where the journalists of America decided journalism is more important Mm. than politics or even our friendship, even our positive relationship with politicians, which a lot of them had. Mm. Um, and so, a lot of them were jeopardized. In, in the early, early in the film, they're talking about how upset they are that they don't get to cover the president's daughter's wedding. You know, which is a, a puff piece. There's, that's not really a news story. Mm-hmm. But they weren't invited, and how dare they be snubbed? Now, this takes place in a point uh, when the Washington Post wasn't known for their like t- hard hitting journalism. They were not a major, major newspaper at no, the time. So this, they were around for a long time, but they weren't the New York Times. So even though, yeah, the New York Times was like the big guy, mm-hmm. and they had all of you know they had bigger budget. They were more better respected. They got all the invites. The Post was always the the, the scrappy like C list paper that people were like they were get, being outsold by local papers. There's a great scene in the Post where Tom Hanks sends basically an intern oh. to the New York Times just to like, hey, just sneak in and see what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Like, he takes a package off a mail pile and just walks around with it. Yeah, oh, like, I'm looking for this guy. <laughs> like, that's it. Like, you want the sixth floor. So, about this story. <laughs> that's a great sequence. Um, it, it, I mean, it's Spielberg, so and he knows how to make a film dynamic, even if it's just about talking and walking around an office room. So mm. the camera spins and whirls, and everything's designed within an inch of its life, and everybody's dressed really well. And the dialogue's actually really... It doesn't really crackle, but it's interesting. Yeah. And, like, it's it's not Aaron Sorkin or anything. We'll get to him. But, <laughs> he uh, has a movie this week. <laughs> or next week, but anyway. But, uh, so it's, it's just really, really exciting to watch. Yeah. And you can tell that the comment about the way journalism has... Uh, an actual ethical duty to confront those in charge yeah. that, you know, the, the notion of a free press is actually a really heavy burden. Yeah. It's all right there. It's all played kind of lightly or, it's, it's, or, or it's rather a spry little movie he- heavily in that Hollywood sort well, of way. It's funny. The closest like narrative and thematic uh, uh, parallel we can make in Spielberg's career mm. is, uh, is Lincoln. Definitely a hundred percent agree. I feel like in some respects, the way he plays it a little bit more like Amistad, which is a yeah. which is a pretty good movie, and I no, like that movie. It's not. No, I'm going to throw it out there. No, no it's not. Like, hear okay. me out. Hear me out. Okay, Amistad is a good idea for a movie. Mm. It's got really great performances. There's a lot of really really good stuff in it, and he oversells like four moments way too hard. <laughs> that's that's really the downfall mm. of Amistad. There's some moments where he just he punches you with yeah, those the, scenes. The John Quincy Adams speech, the Give yeah. Us Free sequence. Yeah, and yeah, like those yeah. are great scenes. He just overplays them so much they don't feel like they belong mm. in the same movie. Here he he's riding on the edge of that a couple of times, and it's there, a little frustrating because for the most part, it's is a very confident, very straightforward, letting just the the story tell itself mm. kind of thing. But every once in a while, he's just like, "I get it, jeez, Stephen, <laughs> you publish the article and the world moves. I get it." Mm. It's not a subtle film. No, 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 and and it's unfortunately because it's such an important message. It's kind of a pity to. Just call it kind of a light entertainment because it's easy. Well, it's to, not a light entertainment, but it's well, light. It's light. It's lightish. It's not yeah. not going to be as you know hefty as you think it is. You're not going to be. You're not going to be depressed at the end of it. And know? I think the film itself, as a result, isn't going to have the impact that it perhaps should, mm. especially in the era we're living in, where the media is being controlled by the government in many ways. Uh, yeah, that, that's maybe, a heavy maybe, statement, but like, in, the, add some caveats, the, and we're the, good. Right, to restate it a little bit, uh, the the relationship between the government between 
the government and media is tenuous and strange right now. Yeah, it's certainly and, it's certainly different than it was like a two years ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. The comment here, I think, should be a little more acidic. I think you mm. need somebody like Milos Forman to make a film like this. I think I, I, here's here's what I think about that. There's there's the acidic, cynical, mm. dangerous Patty Chayefsky version of this movie, and mm. it probably would be really great. And I'm probably going to get one. I, I'm, I'm sure someone's yeah. working on like some really really biting satire of our times right now, and mm. I look forward to seeing it. I'm sure it's going to be great. Um. I think what Steven Spielberg is trying to do with this is to create a parallel about another really dangerous political time in American history Mm -hmm. and remind us that we got through it. I think he's desperately trying to be positive right now and to show us that there was this there was another time in which the relationship between the media and the government was very different Mm -hmm. in which people had to make difficult choices that jeopardized their career in order to do the right thing. But it was a watershed moment for not only journalism, not only for our country, but also for women. (laughs) And that's a it's really important to strike that parallel right now. I think I'm willing to forgive him overselling it slightly Mm -hmm. um, because I think there's a lot of really, really great stuff in this movie i think it flies by i think meryl streep is gives a really really great performance and that's i know it's meryl streep but like this is one of her better characters in a while uh, there's there's one scene in particular you'll know it when you see it <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah she's she's fantastic yeah. um and uh yeah no i think this i think i had a conversation with someone online about how if we weren't at this point in history would we be saying all these things about how important the post is and the answer is uh probably not but i think there's a difference between um, saying it's good simply because of when it comes out mm. and having a different level of passion because of when it comes out. Yeah. Because I think The Post would be a good movie regardless. I think it might you know, be like a Munich where people really admire it, but then it kind of fades a little bit. Mm. But because of when it's coming out, people are like, no, really, this is we need to focus on this one right now. Mm. This is a meaningful film. I don't think it's one of Spielberg's very best. But I think it's a very excellently made movie, and uh, I do recommend going to see it whenever you can. Yeah, I, I recommend it too. I'm just, I, I wish it had been a little stronger. Mm. Just a little stronger. It, there, a little less prob- gentle. I, maybe a little, little roughshod. It, 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 <laughs> it would have been, it been fine if it had taken off the gloves, but yeah. It's I all see right. what you're getting at. Let's talk about uh, Scott Cooper's Hostiles. Hostiles. Uh, m- must we? I, know. <laughs> I did not like Hostiles. Okay, so Scott Cooper is the director of Crazy Heart, which I liked, uh-huh. uh, Out of the Furnace, which I hated. Uh, and Black Mass, which I did not see, but he's got Black, Ma- a- Black Mass is the best of. Well, no, Crazy Heart's the best of those three. Yeah, Crazy Heart's a good little uh, character think, movie. It's not, Crazy, Crazy yeah. Heart is good because it's really character driven. Mm-hmm. Uh, Out of the Furnace is misery driven. Yeah, and he doesn't really and, have anything meaningful to say about that. And misery. Black mm-hmm. Mass, I, I heard it compared to a vampire movie because you know, <laughs> Johnny Depp puts on like this weird makeup and just tears through people like he's a monster, and it's it's actually kind of exciting to watch, but it's not great. But what I think uh, from what I've seen, again, I didn't see. Black Mass, he's, he's got interesting ideas about sort of masculinity and regret. I think that's one of the, <laughs> those are the things he tends to focus on a lot. And that's I, what I have for breakfast every morning. It, yeah. It's like he, he, he makes the movie version of whiskey and cigarettes and, <laughs> uh, and, and hostiles a, is another yeah, version a of that. living Tom Waits song. Hostiles yeah. is a Western, uh, a very well shot Western, very oh, grand looking Western. Beautifully, beautifully photographed, uh, stars Christian Bale as an American soldier, uh, after uh, the Civil War. Yeah, this is eight, 1890s. Yeah, so, yeah. So, after Custer's couple, last stand and couple, A couple decades after the Civil War. And uh, Christian Bale has killed a lot of Native American Indians. Yep. A lot. And, and I know there's some... Uh, uh, Debate over what the correct terminology there, and we want to use the right one. Mm. If we're using the wrong one, we well, meant to use the right one. We're yeah. white. We'll say Native Americans, but I've yeah. I've talked to Sherman Alexi, a, Na- a Native American, and he says Indian is fine. Okay, that they that in, in his community they call themselves Indians. We mean so, well. Yeah. We mean well is the point. Um, mm. So uh, he hates Native American Indians. Hates them. Mm. Uh, he's killed a lot of them, but in his defense, what he says is, "But they killed a lot of us." Mm-hmm. And it's at no point does anyone say, "Yeah, but who started it?" Like, <laughs> right. no, that part never and comes it, up. Well, and, but and here's where the problem with the movie is. You know, they're trying to say, "Okay, we're we're killing you. You're killing us. It's the cycle of violence." And there's no solution to all of this. It's very nihilistic, this movie. And mm-hmm. it even starts with this really brutal massacre. Indians kill a bunch of people, mm-hmm. and. 
just like in a lot of westerns from like the 30s, the Indians are typically like half of the Indians are depicted as these really horrible, just murderous monsters. Yeah, the first scene could have come out of a, a it, the first scene could have come out of a D.W. Griffith movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just with more squibs. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and uh, the other uh, Native American characters uh, mm. represented mostly by Wes Studi. The great Wes Studi. The great Wes Who's one of the great underappreciated actors, if you ask mm. me. I always love Wes Studi. <laughs> no, I think he's fantastic. He's one of my favorites. I love but, him in uh, every movie. Unless you can master your rage, your rage will be your master. That's what you're going to say, wasn't it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quote from Mystery Men. We I, both love Mystery Men. <laughs> I do that a lot. Um, uh, so Wes Studi uh, is sort of like another kind of cliched Native American character mm. in that he's peaceful and kind of a wise sage who always has a saying that he can break out at any minute. And wow. both of these... Now, West Studio is a good enough actor that he's pulling a lot of humanity out of this cliche. There's also, but I there's think he's also not a, written very well. No, I don't think he's written very well either. I think they try to... What they do is they build him up a lot. And then mm. Kristen Bale talks about how many people West Studi has killed. And I think he even says he's seen West Studi's character kill people, like, mm. really brutally. And yet now West Studi's character is old and dying. He's been in prison he's, for a long time. He's dying of cancer, in fact. Yeah, and so uh, Christian Bale, and it's it's an attempt the government is making in order to uh, appease and, and create a more peaceful environment. Uh, Christian Bale is in charge of basically guiding or accompanying West Studi to uh, his burial site. Yeah. that's It's it's a road movie with mismatched people, basically, it's, it's is the like, gist of it. Like, and they're going to learn a valuable lesson. It's um, 48 hours or red heat, basically. Well, but yeah, it, I, I totally he thinks for, it's really are, important. Are they going from New Mexico to Montana or the other way around? I forgot. I think they're going from New Mexico to Montana. New Mexico, okay. Um, and... Um, and that's kind of the movie. So along the way, they run into different people. They run into Rosamund Pike, whose family is murdered in the opening mm-hmm. scene really horribly. She's dealing with a lot of post-traumatic stress. They run into Ben Foster, who is basically Christian Bale if he had gone completely insane and started mm-hmm. killing people. Okay. Can but, we pause and just appreciate Ben Foster for a second? He's so good in everything. He's good in everything. I love Ben Foster. Watch every Ben Foster movie. He's so great. <laughs> um, you, you watch This is a Good Double Feature with 310 to Yuma, another great, a mm-hmm. truly great Western with Ben Foster. Um, <laughs> Because um, Hostiles, here's the thing with Hostiles, it, you might notice we're a little dispassionate about it. It really doesn't bring anything new to the table. It brings this air of significance to it. It's shot very well. Everyone's acting with great portent. But it all really boils down to is the Christian Bale character has got to put aside some of his anger, man. Like, that's kind of all it really builds to, and well, it's frustrating. There, there's been a movement in Westerns, and it's been going on for decades, called, that they call them deconstructionist Western. And we're revisionist a, Western. Revisionist, revisionist Western, one. where we're taking sort of the uh, this myth of the American dream that was put forth by a lot of these Western stories about frontiersmen and Manifest Destiny and saying what, how monstrous and violent that really was. Yeah. The the revisionist western has been going on for far too long. If we're getting to a film like Hostiles, where we can do the revisionist western tropes and have it be completely boring and meaningless. Well, now the revisionist western is the institution. Like, mm. listen, I'm going to say this right now. I like the western genre fine. Mm. Uh, there are westerns I like. There are westerns I dislike. Just like there would be in any genre. Um, but the modern western, largely with some exceptions, isn't very interesting. In fact, if I repressed, I would say the great. Western story mm. of our time, maybe if you go to television, but I would say the great Western story of our time is Red Dead Redemption, <laughs> which a, is a video game, which is a really <laughs> great video game with a lot of interesting ideas and salient points to make. Mm. And it actually does explore different ideas of the old West while still engaging in some of the more entertaining tropes. Mm. And here what we've got is the entertaining tropes are robbed of all their entertainment value. Uh, and all we have left is the basic idea of a revisionist Western, which, honestly, I think Clint Eastwood shot in the foot with Unforgiven. I think Unforgiven is not the end-all, be-all of the modern Western, but I think by that point, we needed more nuance than mm-hmm. just, oh, well, weren't white people jerks? Yes. <laughs> we need a little bit more than that if you're going to make a movie out of it. They they keep on trying to bring back Westerns. Like, every, every year or so, there would be one or two really notable ones. And I've noticed that the better ones tend to be really kind of psychedelic in a way. Like, we're not just re- revising the content of Western. Now we're revising the very... St- style of it. Which I'm actually fine and, with. And, Styles and evolve over like. time. Yeah, like, I, like. I actually liked the remake of Magnificent Seven. It's not a better than oh, the original. Well, it's an entertaining Western. It's it's, it, it's excitingly filmed. Mm. The cast is really good. There's good stuff in that movie. I would tell someone to see that. It's not as good as the original or the original original. <laughs> Which is the Seven Samurai. <laughs> yeah. But like both of but what's interesting is that all of those films 
Well, Seven Samurai was of its time, but even that was sort of uh, rewriting the idea of the samurai movie. Mm. And then we rewrote the idea of the Western based off of the samurai movie. Uh-huh. And now the new what Magnificent Amberson was, uh, Magnificent Amberson, the new Magnificent Seven was uh, uh, rewriting the Western based off of more contemporary action ideas. These things are fine. You can do this. Hostels is just really just trapped in the past, but it treats itself like it's doing something exciting and new, and it's not. The act, the cast is all great, but their roles are mostly underwritten, and they don't have a lot to do, and the plot is pretty predictable and straightforward. It's mm. just not a particularly interesting movie. It's not terrible, but it's like really <clears throat> middle of the road for me. It like left no impact. Uh, it, it left no impact. It was just sort of dull. It was a, a pretty thing to look at for a couple hours, and... Without a, it felt like it didn't just didn't have a thought in its head. Like yeah. the, the thoughts we don't need this. Like why do we need this movie right now? Why did the story need to be told? And it doesn't need to be because of politics or because of any sort of important theme. It could just be we have a really great story. And we need to tell this story. They didn't even have that. Yeah. Um, cameo by uh, I, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. Corianka Kilker. I, uh, Kil- yeah, from from Kilcher the New World. The New World. Who co-starred with co-starred with Christian Bale. New so, World was a great movie. Yeah. Yeah, the, so there you go. The new, if you want a to see movie a, that has a reason to exist. If you want to see a really beautifully shot, not Western, it's a colonial movie, but a yeah. really great film about colonialism and history with those same two actors, see Terrence Malick's The New World, it's because that one's great. Yeah, it's a legitimately <laughs> great movie. All right, let's move on to Alexander Payne's very odd downsizing. Okay. I don't know what the hell he's doing this time. I think I do. I just don't think he did it well. Okay, so I, Alexander Payne, all right. for those who don't know, uh, Alexander Payne is a director of many independent movies, many of them very celebrated. He directed Election, mm. uh, uh, ne- Nebraska? Nebraska was ne- his. Yeah, he did um, About Schmidt. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the, Descendants, the Descendants. Citizen Ruth. Um, he's, he's one of the more celebrated independent filmmakers of his generation, but most of his movies are very, they're humorous, they're sad, but they're relatively grounded. Mm. He's done some uh, punch-ups on more mainstream Hollywood stuff, but all the movies he's directed, pretty grounded, until Downsizing. Downsizing... is a science fiction story. (laughs) Downsizing takes place in the near future, where an enterprising scientist has found a way to successfully shrink human beings down to basically the size of one of the smaller G.I. Joes. They're about... Like a battle beast. About three inches tall. Yeah. And... Uh, and it's a medical procedure, and it's irreversible. Yeah. And but the idea is that if we all shrink ourselves, we won't use up nearly as many resources. Mm-hmm. We won't have as much of a footprint on the environment, and we can actually prolong the life of the human race. And so, a lot of people, for that reason, are shrinking themselves. But also, it turns out if you shrink yourself, your money because, can buy smaller things. For your money goes a lot further. Yeah. Like, yeah, like so, like the cost of you know, like. $85 could be your food budget for a couple of months. Like, you're actually, like, doing really, really well. So a lot of people are taking all the money that they have and putting it into basically, li- like, a McMansion. Doll houses, yeah. Like, doll houses that they can live in, and there you go, Bob's they're, your uncle. But they're all, you were about to say McMansions. They're all these, like, really tacky, really overly glitzy, conspicuous consumption type of things. Yeah. People are buying diamonds and gold because they are only buying trace amounts. They're only three inches high. They don't need that much. Well, they don't need any. But yeah. like, regardless, so the I, that, that's that's the basic idea. Matt Damon plays a guy who has a wife who doesn't quite get him, played by Kristen Wiig. Uh, he's very, very nice, but his career never really went anywhere. And he's partly... Shrinking himself to make his money go further. He's partly shrinking himself to help the environment. But he's mostly doing it because this is one of those movies where a middle-aged guy goes through a major life change. Yeah. Because no matter all the sci-fi trappings of this movie, (laughs) all of the politics that it espouses, and it brings up a couple of interesting ideas I'll talk about in a second, all it boils down to is midlife crisis movie. It's a midlife crisis movie about a clueless white guy who tries to find a path and a generic uh, with, dude, a g- generic too. boring dude, yeah. who, who's brought to enlightenment by minority characters. Yeah, which uh, is, so so mm-hmm. a lot of people have been really harshly criticizing this film's treatment of its minority characters. As it turns out, even in the world of the shrunken, that there's kind of a caste system, and that there are wealthy white people and not wealthy not white people. 
it doesn't matter how far the dollar stretches, we still need, like, a, a, I guess an abused underclass. Well, and I, I think that's part of Alexander Payne's message here, I, that, that there's still going to be a class struggle, even if the money doesn't matter anymore. I think, I think his point is, mm-hmm. and I think the, by the time you get to the end of the movie, I think this, this does play out. I think the basic idea behind downsizing mm-hmm. is that any dr- drastic thing you try to do to change your circumstances and change the world... Maybe you'll accomplish something. Maybe you'll shrink down or whatever like that. But people will always be people. People mm. will always be, in many cases, inherently decent and also horrible to each other. Right. And people will always uh, give into problematic group think, where they you know get enough people together and they'll convince themselves of anything. Mm. Um, all of these things are valid, reasonable things to explore in a sci-fi environment. But man, this is just this. It feels like you didn't need to shrink anybody to get this story told. <laughs> it doesn't even. It's not even like the Flintstones, where like the majority of the Flintstones is literally any sitcom, but occasionally they'll use a mammoth as a vacuum cleaner, right? Like where it's just like a side joke. The shrinking stuff is kind of forgotten for huge chunks of the movie. It's really and, not important. And you know, since I love the sci- that like science fiction element of it, I wish that they had explored a little bit further. You know, what what are the really the impact of this? Why don't we see this in the long run? You know, your dollar stretches so far when you first shrink yourself. Yeah, but what happens when, like, 80% of the planet is now shrunk and the dollar is kind of settled back to normal? Yeah. What are the consequences then? What if a pigeon comes by? There is a couple of jokes about the birds. <laughs> yeah. Because they all have to be in, like, actually, like, enclosures with, like, nets over the sky. Uh-huh. There's a couple of things that, like, I really do think there's some really interesting subtle work being done with some of the production design here. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, like, some of the, like, quote-unquote outdoors, uh, or some of it literally outdoors, some of it not uh, smaller communities, like the patterns of the wood are significantly larger, and they're subtle, just yeah. subtle things that you would just, or like the, I think but, even, the clothing I think, all looks normal, which kind of bugged me. That I wish bugs they were me big, too. Wearing, like big, heavy clothes. But there's a part have, of it where they're yeah. on like a boat, and I'm pretty sure they actually like made it so that the water ripples would be different yeah, than it was if yeah, they yeah. were on an actual real life boat. All of those things are actually kind of interesting and like create a distinct sense of place. Mm-hmm. But the the story is just. Matt Damon's worried he wasted his life. Mm-hmm. Makes a bunch of huge yeah. decisions that he ends, some of which he ends up regretting, some of which make him a better person. Mm-hmm. Didn't I'm, need to be shrunk for that. You could have done that. He could have started a rock band and you have the same basic plot. Like there, There's a big twist. And this is a long movie. It's over two hours long. It doesn't need to be. But uh, there's a big twist about two thirds of the way through uh-huh. where they try to uh, kind of re... And I'm not going to tell you any, anything what happens, yeah. but they do try to rejigger... Uh, what's been going on with the universe and Mm -hmm. uh, the universe of the film and kind of change the theme of the movie. And it feels like that big change is so dramatic that it becomes like, yeah, the whole shrinking thing falls by the wayside. Yeah, it's kind of And it becomes a different kind of science fiction story. And I actually kind of like... they. that's an interesting story that they start I, to tell, but they don't explore that enough. I know. I like the ultimate. Christoph Waltz plays the Christoph Waltz character, <laughs> um, who is basically he's Christoph Waltz, or he, and he's the good guy, or he's Christoph Waltz and he's the bad guy. Mm. Here, he's the fun neighbor, <laughs> and I like him in this because he's got a fun perspective on a lot of things. And you know, there is this big turn towards the end of the movie where things get a little bit more heavy, a, a little bit heavier. Mm. And I, when Christoph Waltz finally speaks his mind about it. He makes so much sense that I'm just sort of like, okay, cool. All right, that's a good way of looking at things. Uh, But yeah, I guess it's a much ado about nothing kind of movie. Mm -hmm. And it's not that funny. It's not that dramatic because it's ultimately not explaining anything terribly interesting. And the science fiction brings up a couple of interesting ideas, but it's not explored very well through the storyline. It's just kind of a nothing movie. Uh, Alexander Payne is clearly trying to find the movie as he's making it, and he never finds it. Yeah. Too bad. Uh, I, okay. Yeah, nothing else. Well, let's, let's 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 switch gears entirely. Tell me about a film called Beyond Skyline, which is a <laughs> sequel to a movie that I thought sucked. But uh, there was a movie called Skyline a few years ago. It was a low budget. Basically, it was like a zombie movie where everyone was trapped in one location. Outside, there's a bunch of attacking forces. But the idea was, instead of zombies, it was an alien invasion. Yeah. And there were a whole bunch of like robots walking around. And it was made by... War of the Worlds is what it is. Basically, but yeah. it was treated like that sort of isolation uh-huh. uh, zombie dynamic. Like, that's like the screenplay structure. Mm. But all of the actual like action and horror stuff was sci-fi. And it looked really cool. Like, all the, the yeah. visual effects were pretty impressive. The story was terrible. And the characters were terrible. Yeah. Uh, so I'm hoping the sequel is better. Th- this one stars... Frank Grillo, and and uh, like Frank Grillo, and later on in the film, the guys who did um, the um, oh gosh, I, the the raid movies, Eco, um, Eco Uwes, Uwe, and... Eco Eco Uwes, and 
the other guy. The other guy. His guy name is Save Saint. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, Frank Grillo is just a guy in L.A. He's trying to you know bail out family members from jail, and then the aliens invade. And for a, a long while, it's just about people sort of running to evade the aliens. But then all of our main characters, a lot of just nondescript human characters, are sucked up into the alien mothership. And the alien mothership starts pulling out their brains and putting them in alien robot soldiers. Cool! I'm with you, Beyond Skyline, because we see the brains and they drip <laughs> glop and we see the big alien tentacles carrying them across these big yeah. alien corridors and shh. Like shoving them fist first into these alien corpses. <laughs> the alien corpses spring to life and start firing alien missiles, and it's awesome. And then the aliens get back on Earth and they land in front of a bunch of kung fu guys. <laughs> They land on Earth, and the kung fu guys start kung fuing them, and there's a lot of cool alien kung fu fights. One of the brains thinks for itself and breaks through, and it can see itself as a human and an alien, and starts fighting against its alien consciousness, and it puts itself inside an even bigger alien robot. And there's a kaiju battle between an alien robot and a Cthulhu-looking monster that is the leader of the aliens, and it's awesome. Where does this land on your best of the year list? Because this sounds amazing. (laughs) Um, This gave me the same sort of thrill I got watching like an old Godzilla movie. It It sounds like they did a really good job with this. They did a really, like... Wow! Because I hated the original. I just thought it was a bad movie, but man. The tone is a little too like terse. They're trying to make it feel a little too realistic but at its heart this is just a really fun kitty like really strange kitty monster matinee from 1964 <laughs> <laughs> there that's Zetra man that, that yeah that's spirit like a trends or z like this is just sort of springing up underneath kind of bleeding through the cracks that by the end when these giant kaiju are fighting in thailand while there's kung fu going on at their feet you can't help but have a good time. That sounds like a really great... I'm sorry, yeah. you just sold me on Beyond Skyline. <laughs> I had no interest just because I didn't care for the original, yeah. so I didn't see it. The, the first, I wish you told me it was amazing. The, I would have sought it out. The first time I saw a human brain, I'm sold. It's like, <laughs> I'm with you, Beyond Skyline. You're gonna sh- If you're going to suck out human brains and plug them into alien robot fighters, I'm with you. So I just want to make it clear. We're Okay, so I didn't see Beyond Skyline. Uh, Whitney clearly liked it, but it sounds like he's on my wavelength. <laughs> uh, but we didn't care for downsizing our hostiles. And I think the reason why mm. is it kind of boils down to our basic ethos about film criticism. It's all about what is the film trying to do and how well does it do it. Yeah. If you're trying yeah. to be super important and you fail, that's not good. It's still a failure. Yeah, it's still a failure. Even if you just hit mediocrity. If you're trying to be super cheeseball and you succeed, good job. Good job, Beyond <laughs> Skyline. So I wrote a review of this one for IGN and I gave it a, a kind of positive review. And I'm I'm kind of dreading. <laughs> like I I can be more passionate about Beyond Skyline than I can be about Star Wars. Because you know, Star Wars did a lot of big things and it was really slick production and it was felt kind of big and portentous but I left feeling like I had a pretty good time I watch a cheese ball nothing film like Beyond Skyline well, like the I, safety I, is off and like anything yeah, can really and, happen and I yeah. feel and I, I'm just having a little bit more fun with a movie that's like cool. Beyond Skyline that's really cool <laughs> well I, that surprises the hell out of me I'm so glad to hear that that's mm. really awesome alright let's talk let's shift gears again mm. let's talk about Aaron Sorkin's Molly's Gambit <laughs> now Aaron Sorkin is one of the few I would argue people you could describe as an auteur in the film industry who isn't a director. Yeah, like any yeah. Aaron Sorkin screenplay, doesn't matter who directs it, feels like an Aaron Sorkin movie. Uh, the way he write, there is a few screenwriters. Uh, most of them are also directors, but there's a few screenwriters who you can hear like three lines of their dialogue, and, and you, you, can tell you know them. who it is: Quentin Tarantino, uh, Kevin Smith, Neil yeah. LeBute. Uh, there's a, a couple. Like you yeah. just know how they just have a, their characters speak. They have Whit a, Stillman is another one. They have a very strong voice, and I think some people think that's a problem because oh well, they can't like deftly fit into any life. Like no, they just have a style. Like any Preston Sturges movie sounds like a Preston Sturges movie. Mm. And it's good. Right. So I'm fine with that. So he has taken his ultra intellectual, Mm. everyone's a type A personality, (laughs) uh, 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 full of insight and anecdote. And and, and intelligence. And intelligence. There's a lot of intelligence. They're all incredibly smart. They're all incredibly well read. Mm -hmm. They're all kind of cynical. And you know what? 
I kind of love his dialogue. I, I, I don't love everything he's done, but when he does something great, it's truly great. Social mm. Network is great. I think his Steve Jobs movie was actually really great. I think mm. got kind of a bum rap. Um, he, he's written a lot of amazing television, and there are times when it feels like he's kind of just trusting his voice to get you through not particularly great yeah. material. I'm looking at you, the newsroom, which had the potential to be great and was occasionally great, but most individual episodes mm. felt like we're just kind of watching Aaron Sorkin do his thing, yeah. and it didn't necessarily fire. Uh, Molly's Game is it's the first film, first film of his as a director. Yep, uh, I'm not sure if he did any TV. This might be his did. first directing th- at all. I think it's his first official uh, directing as a as a film or TV. Yeah. He's telling the story of Molly Bloom, not the one from Ulysses. Although I'm glad they brought it up. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you were Irish. You're thinking of Ulysses. Ulysses is an Irish book with a character named Molly Bloom. Like, like actually yeah. explain that in dialogue. But uh, um, Molly Bloom ran uh, poker games. Super like, high stakes super poker Super high stakes games. Polar, poker games. She uh, worked for a famous person who is never officially named, uh, who got her into these high stakes poker games. Who And she ended up starting her own poker games. But the world of this high money was so high energy, she started to like, she had to take drugs to make herself kind of stay focused on all these mm-hmm. poker games because she was working all night every night. She started doing some more nebulously legal things and ultimately yeah. her poker games attracted the criminal element and based on that she was indicted by the FBI who wanted her to talk and reveal everything she knew about every criminal who had ever been at her table and she refused to name names because she felt like she would destroy the lives of people who mm. didn't do anything wrong and were simply yeah, yeah, at yeah. the poker she, game. So they, they not they wanted more they wanted the criminals and everybody else, and she's like, "Well, I, I can give you the criminals, but I'm not going to give you these other guys. These yeah. are just you already know the criminals. Gamblers, otherwise, you yeah. wouldn't have indicted me. So, right. like, you're just so she was basically used as a as a pawn mm. in a in a chess game between the FBI and a mm. and the criminal underworld. Um, and she's an interesting character. She's a very intelligent woman um, with uh, you know a very unusual story. Um, and she, she used to be an Olympic skier, and that didn't work out for her because of an injury. Really, like a really, catastrophic really, really catastrophic injury. There's yeah, so, a good opening scene about um, that. And uh, she's played by Jessica Chastain, who is, of course, good in everything. Mm. Now, I think my problem with this movie isn't that it's bad. It's not. It's it's well written. It's well acted. Um, I think the biggest issue for me is Aaron Sorkin as a director. I think... Most of the other great filmmakers who have taken on an Aaron Sorkin script and done something great with it have taken his dialogue and his storytelling style and applied cinema. Yeah, like, like capital like letters to it, their own their own sort of master aesthetic, and yeah. uh, uh, and the social network is definitely the the, the er example of that. And, and even and I think even Steve Jobs is very uh, is very dynamically composed in in every conceivable way. He's really trying to jazz up what a movie, which is basically just dialogue, and so is Molly's Game, and. Aaron Sorkin as a director, I think this would be a great pilot for a TV show, it, the, but it's not very excitingly told. Vi- visually, and in terms of its pace, I totally agree. Um, he doesn't really know how to handle cinema. He knows how to handle television better, and you can mm-hmm. tell by watching Molly's He's Game. getting out it's, of the way of his dialogue and his characters, yeah, rather and, than putting them in an, in an exciting so framework. There's there, there's a lot of just, like, flat lighting, flat angles, mm-hmm. very utilitarian filmmaking, which I think kind of slows down his, his uh, dialogue. Right. Also... I think Jessica Chastain might have been misdirected. She's a very, very talented actress. I do love her. Uh, And she's trying to make this character really soulful when I think she needs to be a little bit more snippy. Especially given that this movie is, beyond just being a a crime story, is very much about misogyny. Yes. This is about a woman uh, who, you know, was only ever seen as eye candy. She's like the pretty receptionist. Mm-hmm. That's who, what she was originally hired for. She was hired to be a pretty receptionist. And, and then she, she was hired to show up at the poker games, look attractive, and count the money. Yeah, and eventually she ended up employing like other models, like Playboy Playmates and what have you, to run these games. And these women are all running what is essentially a boys club. Mm. And the movie is never really gets a, pushes us into... The, that realm that Aaron Sorkin is clearly trying to comment on. He's mm-hmm. not talented enough a filmmaker to add the moments where we're talking about these strong women who are essentially trying to deconstruct and disassemble the boys club mm-hmm. from what they're, from seems like the outside. Well, for I think while. they're taking it over from within. 
I yeah. think the, the boys club is thinking, here are the women, they're just running all these things on the side, mm-hmm. and we're the ones at the table. And it's like, the table is nothing without all of these women. Mm-hmm. And we're on that side. And you're right, there's so much to explore there. And I feel like we kind of only get lip service because we just have to have this plot about whether Idris Elba is going to represent her in court. And that's well, the least interesting part of the movie. Well, the least interesting part for me, and even though there's a lot of great, again, great dialogue, is the, the, the father issues subplot. Oh, Kevin Costner has a really not great role here. He, and he has, he it's all culminates in a scene that is really, really, what's the word I'm looking for here? Contrived. Contrived. Really contrived oh. final scene with Kevin Costner. It drives me up yeah. the wall. It's, and, it's not a well-written bit. Well, and, and it's really kind of a pity to boil down this woman who finds that she does have this talent and can deconstruct this very male-dominated thing from the inside using the women that these men have previously kind of disposed or dismissed. Uh into a story about a woman with daddy issues. Yeah. That didn't tacky. sit well with me at no, all. That doesn't work. So while I really love the dialogue and I really love, you know, it's really just, like I said, crackles earlier in this episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it really kind of, the, the scatter shots and the intelligence is really, really fantastic. It's really dynamic to watch. The visuals aren't that interesting. And the ultimate message beyond about, every strong woman just has daddy issues is really kind of it, thudding and graceless. I, I think, I think a more graceful filmmaker would have gotten around that and yeah, used, yeah. and used some style, use some clever framing. I think used... if just Jessica Chastain is the right actress for this role, mm-hmm. but I think if they had a stronger director, they would have directed her to be a little bit more uh, c- confrontational. Yeah, I think so. I think I think it's uh, it's a bit of a shame. Honestly, mm-hmm. I would have loved to have seen what someone like Catherine Bigelow could have done with yeah. this. Yeah, you know, that would have been yeah, really yeah. cool because she's she's a confrontational mm-hmm. director and she's also a very intelligent director. Mm-hmm. And I would have loved to see how she would shoot a poker game because <laughs> she knows how to shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, or, so or to bring him up again, Milo Schwarman. Why there you not? Go. <laughs> like, uh, but at the same time, it's not a complete wash. But yeah, it, it feels like a, a missed opportunity mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Well, a lot, a lot of great acting, a lot of great dialogue. But speaking no, of a lot of great acting, mm-hmm. let's talk about Phantom thread a movie that is very difficult to talk about without going into spoilers um and i think this is the kind of movie where you can talk about the ending and not really spoil it i don't think but i'm not gonna but i'm still not gonna give it away i don't think Um, you should so this is the latest paul thomas anderson movie the director of boogie nights and there will be blood and my personal favorite of his punch drunk love um and it's a film that stars Daniel Day Lewis as a fashion designer in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. He is uh, hailed as a genius. I don't know enough enough about, uh, enough about fashion to say that for certain, but so the story goes. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of the movie, he has a muse, a woman he has brought into his life, and she has just gotten annoying as of this morning. <laughs> and so he talks to his, I think it's his sister. It's, it's his sister, played by Leslie Manville, and she's also actor. his assistant. And she she has one of the greatest roles of the year, really. It's a great as, as the cynical asshole who is enabling the cynical asshole. Basically. Um, she's like one step away from being like Rebecca. like The, yeah, the, 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 the maid and Rebecca. The ma- yeah, yeah, it's one step away, but not quite there. Um, so he's on the hunt for a new muse, and he finds one at a small cafe mm-hmm. by the lake or the shore somewhere, and she's played by Vicky Creeps, mm-hmm. who is, I don't know if that's, I think it's how you pronounce it, a great actor yeah. who I was not terribly familiar with before this. Um, she's terrific. She's so good in this. And it, it's her really movie, incredible. It's about her because she is kind of brought into this world of high fashion, this very serious, <clears throat> excuse me, artist who uh, has a lot of money and you know, has these elaborate breakfasts. And uh, we have we have to pause to to note that Paul Thomas Anderson, who's shooting on seventy millimeter film. Uh, is designing this film to within an inch of its life. Not oh, it's that gorgeous. It's, not that it's elaborate, but you can see the texture specific. on everything. There's a great it, bit. Like the, the bowl that he eats his breakfast out of is very specific. There's a the, scene t- towards mm. the end where they, there's like a, they're at a New Year's party. Uh-huh. And it is maybe one of the best examples of 70 millimeter. Like it's a bit I think Kubrick would have done. Yeah. Just because uh, there's yeah, actually yeah. not that much. He didn't even need to go that big with that. There's so much detail in every part of the frame. But it's it's Fantastic. Finally, this, this really wild crowd scene, and there's big people in costumes. So great! It's, it feels like it's out of a different movie. That one scene, it's but, yeah. pretty great. So uh, basically, she finds out that he is uh, a control freak. He's mm-hmm. very fussy, very fastidious. Uh, he demands that everything be just so. And as a woman who falls in love with him as an artist and as a person, that becomes intolerable. 
mm-hmm. and she starts hatching plans. Now, from, <laughs> so, she, she start. I'm not going to tell you where we go from there. It, well, I'll, I'll say this: it's a, a relationship movie about how these people fall in love and how they stay together, and then they start hating each other with a fiery passion, and yet still stay together, and how that kind of becomes a new way to be a couple. It's about um, how people need. Some people need to control other people. Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, he's always been a visual filmmaker. He's actually very, almost in a lot of ways, the opposite of Aaron Sorkin, and that he's not, people don't know how to speak in Paul Thomas Anderson movies. Yeah, they're not articulate. They can't use their words to let you know how they feel. And there's a great confrontational scene in the middle of Phantom Thread where she's trying trying to say to him, all of this artistry is just artifice and there's no genuine passion in anything you do. Your genuine passion is for aesthetics, and your aesthetics are empty. But she can't say that, and he doesn't know how to uh, either draw it out of her or punch back. He just says, but you're being irrational. And the conversation is just the same phrase, like, repeated eight times back and forth to well, each other. Well, it's like that scene in but The you Master know exactly where they're what's just going saying on. the word fuck to each other over and over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're both completely opposed, but they're meeting in the middle with their inability to talk. Yes. That's kind of fascinating. It's, 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 There's so many things I love about Phantom Thread. There's also a lot of things mm. that put me off a bit, and I feel like this way... I loved Inherit Vice when I first saw it. I think it's a very well-crafted movie, and there's Mm. definitely worth seeing. At the same time, it didn't linger with me over the years. Like, I don't think about it very often, the way I think about some of his other movies. I've seen it a couple times, and uh, Heaven Help Me, it might be one of my favorites of his, but... uh, That's fine. It's a good movie, but I think what I notice, and this is what I take away from a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson films, Mm. I think he's very masterful at creating interesting characters, but I think as a filmmaker, I don't... I think as a filmmaker, he is a bit more Kubrickian. I think he is more looking at them... Than mm-hmm. telling the story from their perspective a lot yeah, of the time. No, that's and, for sure. And that's distancing. And especially in a movie like Phantom Thread, where people are, al- it's already about distance, mm. it amplifies it and it makes it a, a, a film that's kind of easy for me to check out of at times. Now, I think. Ultimately, where the film leads, there's a lot of surprises. I think it comes together again, there, and I think it's also a surprise. <laughs> I, uh, well, whatever, however you want to play it. I think there's there's uh, some tricks he plays on the audience and on his characters that I think pull it back together again, and I think it make it very effective. And now, that in retrospect, I see kind of more about the characters than I realized I had seen originally, mm. and now I actually like it more, and I've actually thought about it quite a bit since. But um, it it's a distancing film in a lot of ways. It's a bit alienating, it's, and I, it's, that might not be up everyone's alley. I, I'm not sure if I can agree with the fact that it's distancing. I think this might be one of his, maybe not humane, but it's one of his funnier, more relatable, more affable films. Uh, it's, okay. It's, it's short. Uh, we get to know the characters pretty well. It's short. Well, well I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's not trying to make you suffer through long portions. He has a point, and he's going to make it pretty quickly. I think it's his shortest film since Punch Drunk Love. It's not one of his three hour epics it's 130 minutes and it's longer than two hours oh well all right it's it's not short it it feels brief it feels almost trifling in a lot of ways because because what actually happens and and i think it's not as deep as it thinks it is it's not boogie nights where it's full of plot it's not very it's not very deep and it's actually very humorous all of the asshole behavior of the main characters the scene is kind of absurd kind of like in the master these characters are just bonkers and strange and we're invited to because of the distance you were talking about kind of laugh at at them, and I think that brings us a little bit closer to them. See, I think that was my thing. I think I it's wanted not, to be it's more not connected. Cold. I think it's actually very warm. I think I wanted to in, be more connected that, to them. I think, I think you're connecting to the storyteller, and I wanted to connect more to the protagonists. Oh, okay. I think that's, that's what we're talking about here, and that's kind of my point. Is I feel like Paul Thomas Anderson as the storyteller isn't always connected to his protagonists, mm. and I find that distance. Okay, but that's a matter of perspective, and I can totally see it. Either way, it's, I think it's a very good movie. I think it's, it's definitely worth seeing. It's fascinating, and it's the, the great elements to it in particular. I, it, it's very good, but I think something like Phantom Thread would have worked a lot better as a short film, because it's essentially a setup to a punchline. Kind of is. I, I, the, yeah. the, the, the big surprise at the end is, which I'm not going to talk about, don't worry, is is uh, it, it is just sort of the period to the sentence. Yeah. And it's been said that uh, making a short film is difficult because all you can do is sort of set up and then have like a big, uh, like a twist at the very end or a punch. Yeah, it's a lot a of short films play out yeah. like a joke. Like yeah. a joke. And I feel that's the same with Phantom Thread. Mm. It's like, I'm going to bring you in, we're going to have this story, and then 
we're going to put a, a nail in it and then we're going to end the film. I feel like there's an episode of Love American Style with this plot. That would have been fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have so, been one of the weirdest things in the history of television. I, I think Paul, Paul Thomas Anderson could have made this film in 30 minutes and have it be just as impressive. There you go. All right, let's move on. Um, tell me about In the Fade. Uh, in the Fade is a German film. It stars Diane Kruger and it's about depressing ass shit. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, the, Great. So uh, Diane Kruger plays a woman who's married a man uh, who she married him in prison. He had gone to prison for dealing drugs. Uh, it fast forwards six years. They have a, a young son together. He has taken to helping criminals legally. He has gotten out of the drug game. And then uh, the husband and the six year old son are violently killed in a bomb blast perpetrated by Nazis. Great. Uh a big chunk of the film is about her mourning process. Uh, she starts taking drugs herself. There's a lot of questions as to what his criminal past might have been, but she's convinced it's Nazis. And lo and behold, it is. Then there's uh, the second act is all about the trial. And the third act is about the aftermath of the trial. And I won't say what happens after the trial. Um, this is just a really sort of terse, moral uh, walk through just sort of the way violence uh, operates in everyday life. And it is very much about kind of the banal minutia, the everyday boring bureaucracy of death and how we do have to essentially go casket shopping. Well, this and sounds how, great. And how horrible it is. And I have a young son. There's a scene where they go casket shopping and one of the caskets is shaped like a fire engine. And I cried out loud. <laughs> it was just see, it was like, <gasps> like one of those horrible moments. <laughs> There was this one, oh God, I wish I could remember who did it. Uh, there was that famous uh, Ernest Hemingway short story mm. where he had, like, it was like, can you write, what's the, what's the saddest short story you can write? Mm. And it was for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Yeah, yeah. And someone added size 16. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great. <laughs> I wish you could remember who did that. It was so fucking funny. Never worn. Contains a dead cat. You know, that's even sadder. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it is about sort of the, the, it's not the grieving process, but kind of the way hate works your way into this and sort of the, the senselessness of it all. And again, it's kind of a very dark nihilistic film and very much about how the catharsis will never come mm. through this process. Um, you're going to mourn, and there, you know, in American films, it's always about, and we eventually kind of move on. We mm. we learn to fold this into a, our lives. There's a cycle, and yeah. we all move forward. And... This film deliberately robs you of that cycle. About Thanks, how, film. How this the the death was senseless. The mourning hurts, and pain is the end. And it's very, very, very German. <laughs> <laughs> Di Diane Kruger is an actress I very very much love. She's, she's fantastic. She's very fantastic. Yeah. She, she's lovely to look at. She played Helen of Troy for God's sake. Right, but uh, on but who cares? Because she's a really great actress. She, she's also yeah. a really great actress, yeah. and uh, and she's really great in this and playing this really kind of deeply cynical, wounded person who has to go through this horrible yeah. process. But moving on from death and despair, <laughs> uh, let's talk about a different movie. Okay, fine. It's it's quite good, but it's it's a bit of a chore, and it, yeah. it and well, there's if it, it, it there's a, a post act there's a a, a pre credits uh, Chiron where they talk about sort of the effects of violence on society, and he realized at that point that oh, this was supposed to be a message picture, yeah. about you know Nazi violence and the the there were a ton echoes of, thereof. Okay, I'm gonna say this right now. It's, I think it's interesting. I feel like this is almost like a leftover from 2016 because if you look at a lot of the best movies of 2016, a lot of them were about grief. Yeah, a lot of them are about the grieving process. You look at films like uh, A Monster Calls, or uh, Manchester by the Sea, or The Invitation, or Nina Forever, which no one saw but it was fantastic. There's a, or even The Arrival to an extent. Mm. It's it's uh, it's all about the way that we cope with loss, and that's something that I think hit a lot of filmmakers at around the same time. They felt the need yeah. to articulate well, this this powerful internal struggle. It's only just now making it to America, so this may have been made at the same time. Uh, maybe yeah, in Germany. So, um, so I, I listen as someone who has wrestled with the grieving process in his life. Um, ah, part of me wants to avoid movies like this, like <laughs> The Plague, but at the same time, you know, some of them have really, really helped me. Um, I, this sounds way less like emotionally sensational than mm. a monster calls but a monster calls really just hit everything i needed oh yeah no, to the, hit the, when the, I saw this this movie. is anti-sentimentality yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly well let's talk about the hallmark movie oh okay another this, another horror film about grief 
This one's weird, though. Okay, so one of the new Hallmark movies is a film called The Christmas Cottage. Now, the idea of The Christmas Cottage uh-huh. is that anyone who spends the night with someone else at The Christmas Cottage uh-huh. will fall in love. Okay. Now, I love this premise. I love it. Because, seriously, we'll fall, how would they you... They will fall in love with each other? Yeah. Anyway, two, two people who spend the night in The Christmas okay. Cottage fall in love, be together forever. Okay, that's that's great, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm d- hearing does sexuality play into this. Well, two straight. That's men a fall great in love? question. That's a great question, and they don't explore it. I have so many. Fo- I feel like I want to do like that scene in Gremlins two where they just go through all the rules and they ask all the questions. Like I just want to be like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so like, what if we put like, uh, uh, uh like a an eighty year old Catholic priest <laughs> and like. 25 year old Nazi like let's see what happens <laughs> are they gonna fall in love I want to put a wolf in there with a duck <laughs> we're gonna keep them in separate rooms so they're not gonna eat each other but by the end are they in love what about family members can it get really weird and twisted that would be really weird yeah. and twisted I want to know where it goes I what see, a great premise I want to see the Lars von Trier version of this it's movie it's really messed up there's so many possibilities and they do nothing with it uh, now, with <laughs> Lars von Trier would make a movie called Love is Death it opens with this woman who is a busy businesswoman who loves business and, she works and she's at, played by uh, someone Oh, it's not. It's not one no, of the stable. No, okay. no, it's not one of the stable. I'll yeah. find her. I'll find her name because I don't want to not give her a shout out. Yeah. It's, but but uh, it's not Lisey Chabert, it's Candace not, Cameron Bure. No, it's not or, one or of the Alicia main Vitt. ones. All right, the Christmas <laughs> Merritt Patterson. Merritt Patterson. Okay. Yeah. So Merit, she's a businessy businesswoman. She's a businessy businesswoman. She is a, a, a designer, and she has designed a pretty clever idea. For a house in the suburbs that can also be an office. Like, not just a house with an office in it. It's a mm. combination home working space. Okay. And it'll help sort of bridge that gap between city and living. And it's a pretty good idea, actually. But, like, we see it. We actually go to this place. And it looks like they live with the glasses on. Like, everything <laughs> is black and white. The workspace actually is a white wall that has the words work. Like, uh. on it, like big black letters. And we see that it's... In her environment, and they'll do this. You'll see these like subtle visual cues in Hallmark movies where people who aren't into Christmas don't have like a lot of Christmas decorations up. Here they went a different route. Where at her business, it looks like basically her character is the person who decorated the White House for Melania Trump. <laughs> okay? It's you've seen the pictures, right? It's all stark yeah, and yeah. white and colorless and we it's kind of it's kind of interesting, but it's not very Christmassy. Like <laughs> That's what it is. She has like three Christmas like orbs, like Christmas mm. ornaments, just the spheres, but they're gray. Three and they're just gray orbs. and they're just on the wall. That's it. That's Christmas. <laughs> and you join them together and, and you she's gain in a re- the powers of the universe. And she's in a relationship with this guy who like works with her and he looks and talks like one of the reptiles from V. <laughs> like does he eat guinea pigs? He might as well. <laughs> And she goes back home for her best friend's wedding, and it turns out she used to date her best friend's brother, who is also in town. They are oh. both put in charge of decorating the Christmas cottage, and, and they then they get snowed to, in. They have to stay in the Christmas cottage together. They get snowed in. Now, I thought the whole thing was going to be them in the Christmas cottage overnight, stuff breaks, mm. great dialogue, whatever, cheap movie, but you could do it if they have chemistry. They spend the night in the Christmas cottage, and then the movie continues. And the whole are, thing is... Are they is, in love now? They, they are, but they don't admit Admit it, and the whole thing is: Will they admit that they're in love? I'm like, yes. You called it the Christmas cottage. <laughs> What's weird is that this well, one. Would it is... be great if, if it was in the co- in the cottage? They knew what was happening, and they had to resist it. It's like, okay, I'm, we're, we're laying down by the fire. No, put the fire out. Fire out. Fire out. Like, stay away. Stay away. <laughs> See, that would have been really funny. I'm, I'm, I'm putting on a rug, something like the least sexy thing possible. If the characters with personality yeah. would have done that. What's interesting is her whole personality trait mm-hmm. is that she's really OCD. Okay. That's it. That's her one co- Possibly even on the, to the extent where she's on the spectrum because she <laughs> doesn't want any color anywhere. Okay. Like, that's a thing. Like, she's uh. like a villain in Rainbow Bright. Like, it's... <laughs> that's her whole thing. And by the end, you better believe we see that she's learned her lesson because she's wearing a red dress. Like, that's it. That's the whole thing. It's it's <sighs> anti... It, it's It's... It's anti anything that isn't Christmas colors. That's what it is. We have to. We see a white door and we want to paint it red. Like that's mm-hmm. it. That's the whole damn movie. It was such a bizarre little anti OCD film. I couldn't didn't know what to make of it. How weird! Isn't that weird? <laughs> Let's talk about the movies we reviewed because wow, we've been going on for a long time and we haven't even gotten to the main event. All right. 
Let's go. Well, let's, well, we, we said we had a lot. We, we did. did them all. And then we're doing this for a reason. And there again, there were time codes. You you knew how to get to Spice World if you wanted. Hmm. All right. Uh, so on our scale of C minus to C plus, with okay. C plus being the best thing ever and C minus being the worst. Well, maybe not quite to that extreme. A C plus right. is a definite recommendation. Right. C minus is definitely avoid it. We have three uh, thumbs here. All right, Star Wars: The Last Jedi. Uh, hi, C. I'm gonna give it a C plus. Uh, I think uh, just good, good, good pop filmmaking. I think. I think even though you may emerge from it with some critiques, I think what it does right, it does really right, and it's mm. a very exciting film, and it needs to be seen on the big screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's we got the post. The post. Uh, low C plus. I think yeah. uh, there's there's a lot of important stuff, but I can't really get passionate about it the way I would want it's to. It's so skillfully crafted. I'm not sure it's going to crack my top ten of the year, but it is one of the better films of the year, I That's think. for sure. Um, let's see, Hostiles. C minus. Yeah, it's a C it's, minus. It's boring. It's I don't, just, just don't care. It's a lot, much, a lot mm. of effort into not mm. very interesting film. Uh, downsizing, same. C minus, yeah. It's just not interesting. I, I, I'm not passionate about its, its badness, but it's just not very effective. It's just uh, it, weird it, it doesn't, choice. It doesn't know what its point is. Beyond Skyline. Beyond Skyline. A qualified C plus. <laughs> <laughs> For, for for stupid B movie entertainment, it's actually pretty first rate. Well, that's what I that's what it's what I call a four star three star. That's a four star three star movie. Yeah, it'll never be more than three stars, but it hits those three stars hard. <laughs> once once you show me a dripping human brain, I'm I, you you've won me over. All right, Molly's game. Mm. Uh, just a I guess a high a C. It's just a middle C. A middle like, C. It's, it's, yeah. it's too much good in it to say it's bad, but mm. it just does not. Like I, I function I, I, very well. I'm like just, it doesn't. I, in like, retrospect, I'm just not moved to passion, even though there's a lot in it that I really admire. Yeah, Phantom Thread. Phantom Thread, also just a C. Really, just a C. Yeah, I'm really torn. I don't know well, if it's a well, C plus because it's so particular and does what it does, mm. or if it's a C because it's kind of this weird, more experiment than narrative. It, it does what it does, and it's an interesting experiment. But the ultimate result is kind of. Unamb- strangely unambitious for a movie that's this ambitious. Yeah, I got. Um, I want to give it a C plus just because it's it's very well crafted. But that's for uh, sure. but uh, what you take away from it may not last. I think right. Les- Leslie Manville is the takeaway for me. Not even Daniel Day Lewis. Leslie Manville. Leslie Manville, is, Manville yeah. steals a lot of the movie. Uh, okay, in the fade. In the fade. Uh, also a C. Uh, really rough watch. A lot of important stuff going on. Really great acting. Uh, ultimately, just sort of a downer. Tri- downer trifle, if you will. All right, and the Christmas Cottage, which is of course being get graded on a scale, mm-hmm. uh, a a C, a weird C, mm. just a, <laughs> a weird C. It's a weird C. We're right. just watching again. It, just qualified. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Strange film. Right. All right. Anyway, to the main event. To the main event. You voted. You voted for the notorious film you wanted us to review, and your choice was Spice World. Now, you told us what you want, what you really, really want. You told us what you want, what you really, uh, really want. Did you want to? Huh? (laughs) Now, uh, Spice World. Does anyone not know what Spice World is? Spice World came out in 1995, right? Seven. It's 1997. That's exactly what I said. I got it totally (laughs) right. And I don't want you to ever correct me. This is why I do so well on the Schmodown. Because I know the years of every movie. I'm sure they're going to ask about Spice World a Spice lot. Spice World a lot. Uh, so the Spice Girls were at, the Spice Girls were at the height of their power. The Spice mm. Girls are Baby Spice, mm-hmm. Scary Spice, Sporty Spice, Ginger Spice, and Posh Spice. And Posh Spice. Now they were. This was a band that was that did not happen organically. They didn't like play a bunch of like small town <laughs> yeah, dive bars and work their way up. They, they were they assembled by a by a company. Yeah, they, they didn't like yeah start out as a skiffle band and figure out they could work together. They, they were they, they, they were prefab. Yeah, they 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 were a company wanted to put together an all girl band with uh, uh, fun songs, mm. positive messages, good personalities, and they found. These women, who turns out were very charming. They're they're charming. They have great chemistry together. I buy that they'd be friends even if they weren't a prefab group. Yeah, I totally get it because the Spice Girls. Listen, their Spice Girls music is it's bubblegum. It's, it's in, catchy, and innocu- that's about it. Innocuous AF. Yeah, and, there's uh, some good songs. There's some bad songs, uh, but none of it rises above just really catchy. I think. I think it's a couple <laughs> of their love songs are like sincere enough but they have nothing to say there's just sort of Mm. nice and what was really the appeal of the Spice Girls was all their public appearances they were just really funny together I've heard the Spice Girls referred to as sort of the the gap but like it fills in the gap that's like right behind Barbie dolls but before boys 
So there's like this very like little teenager demographic that was really, really, really into the Spice Girls. Well, well they were huge. Mm. I do remember that. Uh, I, I don't know how true that is. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who would debate you on where the Spice Girls function in terms mm. of a coming of age dynamic. What I do think was interesting was the Spice Girls were kind of... Uh, around like the the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s there was this movement for all of our big music musical stars to be independent and artistic and have something to say mm. and then we started moving into these prefab sort of bubblegum generic pop stuff mm. some better than others and the spice girls and then the backstreet boys and NSYNC mm. were sort of the the signal that the trend was moving away from the so-called buzz cuts of smashing pumpkins <laughs> and stone double pilots and Pearl Jam mm. and moving into well, we had a, we're just going to have some fun and dance okay well, it, it was it was a cycle we had a, a big boom of like empty pop throughout the 80s you know, mm. and, and you know there was of course a lot of punk but that was started in the 70s I think they were encouraged to be and, more daring and weird there, there was a lot of weird underground stuff in the 80s as well mm. though. Okay. but you know for the most part the, the decade is sort of, you know defined by a lot of its sort of poppy one hit wonders girls just want to have fun uh, then in the 90s, thanks to Nirvana, there was a big movement toward sort of this introspective, self-obsessed grunge. Mm-hmm. And not not to say that there's not pop going on well, at the same time. But and also, a, don't forget, a, you have to look at something like, you know, NWA. Or, yeah, you know, and then there, there was, was also real this, political this, music going yeah, this on political, that was also mainstream pop. The early, the early 90s, yeah, this yeah. sort of very political, angry music and a lot of uh, hip-hop and a lot of dance music. It all started to, like, rise up. Music had something toward, to say. Yeah, yeah. And then... By the late 90s, <laughs> people got bored of saying things, and we started getting, yeah, sort of the, 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 the bubblegum renaissance, which we're kind of still living through in a lot of ways. I don't think we ever fully left it, honestly. Yeah. I think you look at the stuff on the radio now, and it's, it's feels really like it's dancey, a direct derivation. Right? Yeah, um, For better or worse, you know, some people mm. like it, some people have think it's deeper than that, and that's fine. We're not music critics, so if we're <laughs> getting some of this wrong, okay. Mm. Fair enough. The point is, the Spice Girls were so popular that they got that they end up breaking into movies. Now, a lot of musicians break into movies, and often when they do that, their first role or two, they're basically playing a version of themselves. You saw Hard that. Day's Night. Hard, well, Hard Day's Night was literally them playing the Beatles. I'm talking about a version of themselves, oh, or like okay, Madonna like, in like Desperately Seeking yeah, Susan. Or, um, or did you ever see Paul Simon's film One Trick Pony, where he plays Paul, the Paul Simon type? There you go. And he's trying to keep folk alive, but he keeps getting beaten down by the B-52s. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> Playing themselves. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how have I never seen that? That well, sounds fantastic. Well, they're not like the villains. They, they only have like one scene. But yeah, there's, he like goes out in front of a crowd. He plays this really soulful folk yeah. song. He's gentle and he's Paul Simon. And then he leaves the stage and there's all these like weirdos in the dressing room and they all go out and they start jamming and you realize that's the B-52s playing themselves. So in this weird. movie, it was made in like 1982 or something. Super weird. So it's like even before the B-52s but were I'm thinking, huge. I'm thinking more like the David, also like the David Bowie thing where every time, mm. David Bowie shows up at the man who fell to earth and he's playing an alien who comes to Earth to rescue his home planet, he ends up getting corrupted by mm. all of the consumerism, desires and consumerism yeah. of, of the planet. And he really is kind of playing a different... David Bowie was always a space alien. Yeah. Like, he was that, always... That was, his, it was playing his Ziggy Stardust time. thing, yeah. So what they did with the Spice Girls was the Spice Girls were treated as the new Beatles. Maybe not musically, but in terms of their popularity. Mm. And so they said, fuck it, we'll do Hard Day's Night. <laughs> yep, they just remade the Hard Day's Night. Now we could have paired this with the Hard Day's Night. It was the obvious it's, choice. It's too obvious, so we went in a different direction. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. about our decision making process in a minute because I'm sure a lot of people saw the title of this episode and went, "Huh." <laughs> so I'm looking forward to talking about the other movie. But Spice World was clearly modeled after Hard Day's Night and a little bit of Help, the second Beatles movie, which is an even broader comedy. Mm. But Hard Day's Night is a great movie, and it was the Beatles on tour playing themselves, getting into wacky adventures. It's mostly plotless. Mm. There's not a lot going on. It's just a series of random misadventures. And so is Spice World. Spice, Spice World is about these Spice Girls playing mm. themselves on an adventure. They're traveling around uh, uh, the mostly the UK uh, in a double-decker bus with a Union Jack on it. And there's a great gag where they get on the bus, and then inside the bus is like a giant building. Yeah, it's, it's larger <laughs> on the inside. It's like the, the TARDIS. Yeah. And, and their bus driver is played by Meatloaf. Yes! <laughs> Who, at one point, when he's asked if he can fix their plugged-up toilet, says, I would do anything for those girls, but, but I, I won't, won't do, do that. that. Oh. And you're just sort of like, yeah. yeah I, I'm Meatloaf. I can do that. <laughs> yeah, Meatloaf is allowed. And there are a lot of uh, celebrity cameos. 
Uh, Roger Moore, we mentioned earlier. Yeah, Roger Moore. Plays like the mysterious Charlie type character of Charlie's Angels. He plays, quote, the chief, and the implication is that he, like, runs the label. But every time he just, he calls up their agent, who's played by the great Richard E. Grant. Richard E. Grant is so fantastic. Uh, So Richard E. Grant plays their manager, agent, whatever, and uh, he's the one on the ground making sure they all are where they need to be, getting Mm. angry when things go wrong. But whenever he talks to his boss, his boss is played by former James Bond, Roger Moore, who appears in, like, a Blofeld supervillain lab, Mm. petting a cat, saying weird, completely non-sequitur things. At one point, they phone him up, and he's actually suckling a pig with a baby bottle, (laughs) and it's adorable. (laughs) And you can just tell that Roger Moore is having a great time. Yeah. He's having a delightful time. Roger Moore signed on to play James Bond, and he had fun for the rest of his life. (laughs) Uh... And the, who else is in this? We have um, um, okay, we, Bob Elton Hoskins. John sh- Elton John shows up. Elton, Bob Hoskins has a weird cameo where, where he uh, plays he plays Baby Spice, if I recall. Uh, I think it's I think it's uh, Ginger Spice. Proves oh, okay. that she's a master of disguise by like walking into a phone booth and then walking out, and she's Bob Hoskins. <laughs> and like, he says, "Girl power." Yeah, it's weird. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, yes, yeah, so we got Elton John, George Went. That's right. Mark McKinney, <laughs> Alan Cumming, Dominic West, who would go on to star in The Wire. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. He's a fantastic actor. Very good Before actor. he was anybody, he played their photographer. Um, yeah, just a ton of people show up in this just to have a good time. That's the overall vibe of it is it's just to have a good time. This movie is a party. And it, yeah. people call it bad. People call it notorious. Maybe a little shrill well, sometimes. It, uh, very shrill at times. The, the one complaint you can really level at it is that the Spice Girls aren't nearly as dynamic as the Beatles. They're interesting. They're kind of funny. They're genial. They have good chemistry, but they mostly just kind of scream and yell, yell and run around. Yeah. Uh, and because they are defined by their nicknames, they only each have one personality trait, and they approach every situation either from their personality or isn't it great that we're all friends girl power yeah they they don't like fight for women's suffrage or anything they just say girl power and hold up a peace sign and that's sort of their version of uh i think this sort of like pop little girl feminism which was just sort of entering the 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 zeitgeist i think people didn't know what to do with spice world when it came out Mm. because it's clearly not trying to be more than a trifle it's trying to be a cute Fun, innocuous, there's, playful time at the movies. There's, there's freaking aliens in this yeah, thing, for I, God's sake. I, I, I know. And I think people just were not in the mood. I think there were for the fans of the Spice Girls were, obviously. But like when it came down to, like, Ebert hated this movie. <laughs> you know, I know there's this weird thing where people are like, why can't more critics be like Roger Ebert? And be like, when mm. Ebert didn't like a movie, he, he was mean. <laughs> yeah. Look at, he wrote many books of just his most negative mm. reviews because he was... A, a monster sometimes <laughs> and when it came to spice world he like actively hated it and i think it's because it just refuses to take itself seriously mm. it refuses to take the music industry seriously it refuses to take even its fans terribly seriously well, i think it's just silliness for its own sake and it's okay to watch the beatles be silly because you're listening to the the freaking beatles <laughs> yeah and their music was serious and yeah so the music even the, when it was even, even when it was, it was like relatively s- poppy they were songy they were and kind of kind of skiffly yeah there, there was still a lot to latch on to the spice girls music is not as good as the Beatles. I think I can say that categorically. I think that's fair. Um, and as a result, the Spice Girls themselves aren't as interesting as the Beatles. They're just a bunch of s- silly girls running about having a good time, and that's not terribly interesting unless you are one of them. Yeah. There's this, there's this weird fan insert character who pops up like a like third of the way into the movie or something like that. Where I'm oh, remember, yeah, oh, What yeah, is her yeah. name? Hang on a second. Uh, is it Claire Rush? No. There's a lot of Not Na- Nico Mori, um, mm-hmm. who was eventually show up in Torchwood. Um, it's like halfway through the movie or something like that. She shows up as their friend, Nicola. And she's pregnant, and that's it. She's just going to give birth later in the movie. But they pop in like everyone's supposed to know her. Yeah, it's like, it's yeah, like yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer's sister in season five, where she just shows up and everyone acts like she's been there the whole time. I'm like, she's not a Spice Girl. I don't know. Why Why are you? Is, was she your roommate? Where do, how do you know her? There, there's a certain flavor of bad movie in the world where, and I say bad but from like sort of a skilled 
perspective. Yeah. Like, like badly made, badly put together, badly written. Uh-huh. Just not constructed like a typical movie. Not constructed which to be are, a well-oiled machine. No. In fact, they're, they're not even constructed to be machines. It's usually just a pile of parts. I'm thinking of your pooty tangs. There you I'm go. I'm thinking of your yoga hosers. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of your movies where talented people got together and decided not to be talented. They decided to just Active, let it slide actively. this time. They're, they're not going to put in a lot of effort. They just love the process of putting it together and having a good time. Spice World has that feeling that they're just sort of getting together, doing fuck all, messing around, having a good time, and gosh darn it, you're going to have a good time watching them having a good time. Damn right. Your mileage may vary, but you might have a good time. The problem with that is... Spice World is an A production. <laughs> it doesn't feel like something a bunch of guys just like if the Spice Girls got together with just cameras and filmed themselves and were just having a good time and they put together a documentary type movie, that might have been a lot more fun to watch than this, which is ostensibly a studio backed A production. There's a lot of money behind this. There's a lot of talent behind this. They're trying to make it look like a real movie when it is aggressively isn't. And I think that's where a lot of the cognitive dissonance comes in. We, we're entering this movie. We're trying to trying to get something to latch onto, and it's constantly twisting out of our grasp, insisting that it's just having fun. And it gets really frustrating out of after a while. And if you don't like listening to the Spice Girls music, you're going to be even more frustrated. I have this weird relationship with the Spice World. Where listen, when I was I was a teenager when this came out. Uh-huh. And I was too cool for Spice Girls. I haven't yeah, have listened to real music like Seven Mary Three. Who <laughs> <laughs> was big in 97? Yeah, right. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember right now. So, well, like, I, I'm, I'm going to listen to my Jesus Lizard record. People, man. bands that no one gives a shit about. That's what I thought was all what's, about at the time. What's Whale up to? Yeah. She's cooler than the Spice Girls. Look, I I was I was a jerk. I thought cynicism equaled wisdom, and of course, that's that, that's, not, a, that's the opposite of true. But that's, that's what you think when you're every, a stupid. It's what you think when you're a teenager. Yeah, that's what every teenager thinks. That's what Lady Bird is all about. For like, sake. and the older I get, the more I appreciate that the Spice Girls. Yeah, they were a corporate product, but you know what? They were a corporate product with a positive message and some fun songs. <laughs> That's that. There we could do a lot worse. They were they, they were aggressively shallow. Is the problem? Well, there was not a lot of depth. To I don't anything think. They I don't did. think it was about being shallow. I think it was about just. And I think I almost would appreciate them more now. Just hey, mm. sometimes things are nice. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh really? I'll buy a ticket to your movie. <laughs> like that sounds great right now. I'll, because I, I, mean, I I've seen this movie like four times. Mm. I just watched it again last night. And like every other time I watch it, I change. Like the first time I watched it, I was like, This is terrible. I can't um, handle it. Second time I watched them, oh, this is kinda cute. And they played with the form and mm. you know, there's a lot of like weird meta jokes where someone's pitching the movie we're watching and the movie changes to meet the stupid pitch that he's coming mm. up with. And that's kinda cute. It's not particularly skillfully put together, but they, they there were some a, ideas. They solve a plot plot point in like as an afterthought during the credits it's, yeah. yeah like hey what happened to the bomb and then the bomb blows off off screen yeah. i'm like oh yeah fair enough <laughs> um and then, then i watch it again and i was just like you know it's just not very funny mm. and then i watch it again last night and i'm like you know what it is pretty funny like it's 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 not it's not again it's not like sharply put together by people who really know what they were doing. It feels like it was kind of thrown together while the Spice Girls weren't busy for a couple of weeks. Yeah, but at the same time, they're fun. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are funny. Some of their dialogue is pretty good. They're they're like reasonably well defined in that all they can really talk about is how they each only have one defining characteristic. Yeah, like that's it. And they get like, a little frustrated by that d- themselves. Yeah, like there's this. Um, yeah, so like that that's fine. All the cameos are cute. There are some good jokes. What's weird is that like about two thirds of the way through the movie, they try to. Pre- Tend the Spice Girls happened organically. There's like a flashback like, to like they, this, they met in a diner and decided to sing along. They were yeah, this yeah. local girl group who like knew the guy who ran this diner, and that's where they came up with their big hit. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. It's called. Which, I think it's called Wannabe. Well, yeah, but mm-hmm. like that. That was like their big moment, and now like when they're sad and they almost break up for like literally almost no reason, uh, they all came come back to that same diner. But the guy who ran the diner isn't there because it's closed. And I'm just like, why didn't you bring him back? You created an emotional connection. It's weird. Like, was he was he unavailable the next day? Like, why we what, what happened? So like, it's weird that they try to like rewrite the myth of the Spice Girls so much when they're obviously completely aware of the artifice of celebrity. 
Yeah. And that's really what this is. It's about the artifice of celebrity. It's about the entertainment mm-hmm. of celebrity. It's like, at the beginning of the movie, the Spice Girls are on top of the world, and then L- L- Richard E. Grant is just like the second one bad headline that says, all right, the backlash has started. Let's get let's get working on that. Get ahead of that. Yeah. yeah, right? Like, that's... there's yeah. The plot of the movie is there's actually like a tabloid editor who is sick of having to put out stories of the Spice Girls, so he decides to destroy the Spice Girls so they won't be famous anymore, so he doesn't have to write about them. <laughs> That's a weird. You know, that's a weird plot. As another movie, very much like the Spice Girls, very much like Spice World, that mm. came out several years later, that was much savvier about skewering the way pop music works and the way uh, pop music is sold to people and the way we consume it. And it's called Josie and the Pussycats. You're, you're okay. I'm gonna. I have something to admit right now, uh-huh. and I realize this is sacrilege now because uh-huh. there was a time when this movie came out, no one gave a crap. Yeah. about Josie and the Pussycats. It's been, it's been 16 years since Josie and the Pussycats came out. And I'm pretty sure it's considered a modern classic. It's a modern classic now. It's, yeah, I think people it's, just it's, genuinely it's of, think it's one of great. The, one of those movies that is no can no longer make the most underrated films lists. It's yeah. just people regard it's it. It's not well, even cult. Well. I think just yeah. I've never heard I haven't heard anyone say a bad thing like, about like this movie it, since it, like the year it came out. It regularly plays midnight movies. And I think that movie, well, still sort of like Shit, maybe we should have done that as a double yeah, feature. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> still sort of like vapid and shallow, at least has a little bit more something to say, and the characters are a little more well, interesting. I know it's about consumerism. I know it's yeah. about product placement. I know mm. it's about being used as a commodity. And and it, it kind of skewers the fact that we're my goodness, we're making a movie about Josie and the Pussycats now. Yeah. You know, they're they're trying to get ahead of that. So I think Spice World was on the way to Josie and the Pussycats. <laughs> But it's, it's not as good. Sound. No, but I actually, I, I gotta be honest here. I, there's a lot of people, when this like won the poll on Schmoville, uh, half the people were like, yay! Other half the people were like, Spice World's a good movie. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I see why, I see the argument on both sides. Because on one hand, it's clearly a product. It's mm. selling you the Spice Girls. On the other hand, it does a pretty good job of selling you the Spice Girls. Uh, I, it's an amusing commercial of a movie, and I have a lot of <laughs> affection for it because... It's sweet and it's kind of funny and it flies by. There's, it, even the jokes that are bad, they're so invested in selling that there's like this weird like Muppets Take Manhattan joke where like you know the Muppets Take Manhattan where they talk about like Muppet having Muppet babies and then they just yeah, this weird yeah. flashback where they have Muppet babies. There's like this one terrible joke in Spice World where they talk about what happens when they're all mothers and it looks like a scene from that like sitcom The Royal Family where it's everything's just kind of dingy and crap. It, it and it's not like the, funny. It's just it's it like wouldn't the, it be weird if they were pregnant. I'm like, not really, like but the, okay. The most horrible family in Britain from Monty Python. Yeah. Anyway, uh when it came time to pair Spice World, I mean the obvious choice was A Hard Day's Night. Which is one of the best movies. I it, love A Hard Day's Night, it's great. You've probably seen it. If you haven't, go see it. Go yeah. see it. You're in for a treat. Second obvious choice yeah. would be The Beatles' Help, which is also mm. great. Really, really, really funny. Mm. I think it's a great movie. Uh, Our next choice was The Monkey's Head, uh, no, which I've never seen. You haven't seen Head? I haven't seen Head. Head is unwatchable. <laughs> 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 um, no, I, Head is head is head is a difficult one to get your head around. Um, I, I dig the monkeys mostly thanks to my wife, who is a big big monkeys fan. She brought me into the fold on the monkeys. I have yeah. all credit to her. Um, uh, he, the monkeys were also a prefab band. They were assembled by you know the corporate the machine. They were actual musicians. Yeah. Uh, they didn't write their own songs at first, but then they did, and they played their own instruments. And they're actually ta- all talented musicians. Uh, but when it came time for them to make a movie, they wanted to sort of fly in the face in the most psychedelic way possible, all of that sort of corporate mentality. So they made this really bonkers, surrealistic vignette, scenes don't connect, dialogue just comes and goes, and everything's really soulful until it's not, and then there's commentary on war, and ain't war a bummer, man. It's like easy, closer to easy writer than it is to a hard day's night. Anyway, we didn't do head. We didn't do head. No, and actually what I, those were the thoughts and then you came out with the best suggestion. <laughs> well, the second I saw it, I'm like, yes! Oh what's, my god. What's another movie about a struggling band that is also ostensibly a real life band mm-hmm. on a road trip on a road trip to mm-hmm. make ends meet and make their, their way with a in lot the of world. very silly humor. With a lot of I know, sure what I know silly is the word I, I would go use for. The word silly. Absurdist is maybe. And a little I, and more I accurate. know, like, oh, like, there's. You can probably think of a whole bunch of movies that have that mm. style because Hard Day's Night basically invented that. Like, you could have gone with the Blues Brothers, but instead, we're going with Aki Kurismaki's Leningrad Cowboys Go America. <laughs> okay, let us explain. <laughs> 
Uh, Aki Karazmaki is a Finnish filmmaker uh, who has done, uh, I think it might be best known for the Leningrad Cowboys. Um, the Leningrad Cowboys were a really, dep- in the annals of the movie, are a really depressive, not quite rock band who never smile, and they, they're definitely children of the new wave. They have gigantic pointy hairdos. Yeah, pompadours like out to, like like a like, foot like, and a half in like, front of their head. No, like three feet ahead of them. Yeah. And feet as equally as long. Well, it's not their feet, it's their <clears throat> shoes. Because at one yeah. point, in order to drive a car, they have to take these incredibly long, pointy, like, elf shoes and bend them back and nail it together just so that their foot can you be you can work mm-hmm. on the pedal. The, the joke is that they can never be out of character and I don't think they're capable of being out of character. I don't think there is a character. They're, I think in the movie, this is just who they are. Yeah. Now, Aki Kurismaki teamed up with a a Finnish band. Mm. Uh, the Sleepy Sleepers. Thank you, the Sleepy Sleepers. I was trying to look that up. <laughs> and the idea was they just came up with an idea of, hey, let's come up with a fictional rock band. Or uh, initially it's like a polka band. Mm. And then they move to, they go to America and they're told they had to learn rock and roll. Um, and they become vaguely rockabilly. Yeah, and, it, and a lot of it's sort of this idea of, uh, you know, this, this was, came out in like the 80s, and Russia was starting to fall, mm. and it was sort of bridging the gap between uh, the different sides of the Iron Curtain. Yeah. And so they come to America, <clears throat> well, they get on a big road trip, and so well, well, they come up with this fictional let's, band. Let's pause there, because that's actually really significant. Oh, yeah. About how pop music was not allowed over the Iron Curtain. It kind of leaked through. And in Russia at the time, like for many decades, they were affecting based on little bits of misinformation they had about wet, uh, the West and little bits of pop that made their way over the Iron, Iron Curtain, constructing this weird, bonkers, super heightened, almost surrealistic, Im- expressionistic version of what America was, of yeah. what they thought America was. So if you look at a lot of the the fashion, a lot of what they called the Stilyagi, the, the, the fashion-obsessed Russians, uh, to come out of like the, the hipster scene at the time, it's this fascinating dark mirror of what America was offering. And I think that is the, like sort of the ethos and the aesthetic where the the Leningrad Cowboys came out of. They look like a fun house mirror version of half of American pop. They look like if the, if Gary Larson had drawn an Mm. all Elvis cover band, like (laughs) yeah, just bizarrely caricatured. And and again, the whole thing is they're they're very stoic. Most of them don't have any dialogue or only have a couple of lines throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. They just stand there. They do their music. Um, sometimes they get applause. Often they do not. And their <laughs> agent or manager it was uh, the only one with any kind of personality in this yeah, group. He's 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 dedicated to getting them to making them big stars. But every other step of the way, he uh, basically abuses them. They say they're hungry. They haven't eaten in two days, so he stops the car, buys them a <laughs> sack of onions to eat, and then when they're around the corner, he has a sandwich that he bought for himself yeah, that he has like hidden in his coat, and he's like leaning over, eating it like a bridge troll. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, there's a member of the band who's dead. Oh, yeah. the, opening, the, opening scene, <laughs> the opening scene takes place in Siberia, mm. and like one of the members of the band has stayed out like in the middle of the night in the cold and, and is frozen, frozen stiff death. with yeah. his pompadour shoes and guitar pointed upwards. Mm. Meanwhile, the band is actually having an audition, and the guy listens to them, and they're an okay polka band, and he says. It it's is shit. It's, yeah. it's, we cannot we cannot market this. Take it to America. They'll, They'll listen to anything. anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they go to America. They bring the corpse with them in a in a coffin full of ice. Yeah, which they also put their beer in, and they strap it to the top of a car that they buy from Jim Jarmusch, <laughs> the director of Down by Law, Stranger Than Paradise, mm. Ghost Dog, Way of the Samurai, Patterson. He's, he's- <laughs> That that he's in it is telling. It tells you a lot about the tone of the movie. And then they go have an audition with an agent who gets them a gig doing his cousin's wedding in Mexico. They'll have to get themselves there. So it's a road trip about trying to go through America to Mexico, corpse on the roof, yeah. uh, eating, start slowly starving to death and living in abject poverty and misery. But and they don't seem to really mind that much. That's just sort of the world they live in. No, I it's, it's, it's actually this, like, you know, when you look at Spice World as this sort of really heightened, really glamorous, really mm. colorful, l- the idea of the successful musician 
um, just living the high life, everything going their way. Wish fulfillment for the viewers yeah. in a lot of ways. And, and listen, and, and there are certain musicians who get so big that they live a lifestyle that can in some way relate to that. Obviously, Spice World is ridiculous, but there's it, it's based off of some idea of actual celebrity. The typical musician doesn't live that life. <laughs> and there's a lot of, of, of bands out there who live basically the Leningrad Cowboys Go America life, where... They live in cars. You live in cars. You're constantly mo- on the run. Stay in motels where they can. Not a lot of appreciation. Um, eat a lot of horrible junk food. Yeah, and listen, for a lot of people, that's the appeal. It's mm-hmm. this great, you know, sort of romantic, nomadic existence. But at the same time, it's kind of lonely. There's this great bit where they're all like... One of the Leningrad cowboys has found love with a local woman. And then it just pans to the other Leningrad cowboys. Each of them is looking at a picture. One of them is looking at a picture of a woman. One of them picturing has another woman. One of them is looking at a tractor he just misses a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Leningrad cowboys, like the Spice Girls, are cartoon characters. Sure. Uh, they are, they're, they're stoic. They're, they don't speak a lot. They mm-hmm. don't have a lot of facial expressions. Well, they're hiding under sunglasses and, and uh, hairdos, yeah. basically, for most of the movie. The, they're... they're they they don't even move a lot. They're almost like living corpses. And I think there is a, a very European trope of the sort of comic underdog, like the comic suffering underdog. Yeah, the person who's like, uh, it's almost a Buster Keaton thing. Yeah. Where you're just completely yeah. stone-faced and things happen to you, but you persevere and that mm-hmm. makes you heroic. Uh, and it, and But it's not even about sort of their hero- heroism or their perseverance. It's like, life wouldn't make sense to them if they found success. <laughs> like... <laughs> It's hard to imagine we're, them being... We're not suffering? I don't understand. You know, they, they understand that there's something beyond this world, and they do have a little bit of ambition, and they're trying to do something with their lives, but you understand that they wouldn't be disappointed if they didn't get it. Yeah. They might even be disappointed if they did. They would. Here's, here's and that's the, the joke. <laughs> what the Leningrad Cowboys really, really, really want better food. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's what they want. They want to play their music. They want people to like their music and they want to eat well. Mm. That's about it, really. <laughs> that's about that's their ambition and it's a way more like it's no no no. I like my stick. No, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but I got you a mop. No, no. My stick. <laughs> I I need my stick. It you're, is you're, all you're, I you're, need. you're uh you're uh, um oh, on UHF I want uh, my I want my mop. Yeah. <laughs> it's my mop. Uh, <laughs> I wanted, they took my mop. I brought this from home. No. <laughs> Lenny Red Cowboys Go America is the kind of movie my dad would have loved because it is so. My dad was was such an odd character. He loved World War II movies, mm. ancient Roman epics, and the stupidest comedies he ever saw. <laughs> like he loved Night at the Roxbury. Oh, good god! And like right. and he like Night at the Rock. His like amongst his favorite movies were Three Amigos, mm. Night at the Roxbury, and Cross of Iron. <laughs> <laughs> like the most depressing World War II movie you've ever seen. He would spend all of his days watching the History Channel, mm. and then fucking Blues Brothers came on, and he was in heaven. <laughs> and then that was it. That was his whole <clears throat> viewing experience. Mm-hmm. And um, this movie has such a sweet heart to it. It's it's one of those. It's one of my favorite subgenres. People don't talk about a lot. The poor bastard subgenre, mm-hmm. where they have a good heart. Terrible things happen to them all the time, but they make it to the end of the movie. <laughs> and you just sort of just like if they can make it to the end of the movie, I can make it to the end of my movie. And, and but you know, the, this is not the kind of movie that's going to have like a big catharsis. It's not no. going to end with them playing Wembley Stadium or anything. But here's the irony: in real life, the Leningrad Cowboys became enormously successful. <laughs> the irony dollar was there before you thought it was. Yeah, this was 1989, by the way, and uh, and it, 89 really? I thought it was yeah, 87. The, 89 came okay. out. Of and uh, yeah, the, the Leningrad Cowboys decided to keep on going as a band, uh, and they performed actual music, and they were a big hit. I think because uh, people were latching on to this sort of antidote to pop. Yeah, it's there like, was something. We're, we're, they're very are, sincere. They're very genuine, even though they're a, they're a completely fictional band. <laughs> they're sincere, but their their fictionality, like Spinal Tap, is is meant to sort of take the piss out of fame and success. Yeah, and I think yeah, there was a lot of uh, there's definitely a lot of satire. Even if you go to see their shows and they're just sort of playing this depressive rockabilly, yeah, they're you get the joke. Yeah, if you're a savvy enough audience, will get the joke. 
And now, that's what people were tapping into when they start when they went to see the Leonard Grad Cowboys live. We're gonna go see the Cowboys, the Glenn Grad Cowboys. I quote, "Love them." Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of quotation marks around this movie. But here's the thing: like they're, they're still around. Like they're mm-hmm. still performing. Different members of the band have been kind of different. They played the 11th annual MTV Music Awards. <laughs> they had a sequel called Leningrad Cowboys Meet, Meet Moses. Moses yeah. And they were in a concert movie called The Total Balalaika Show, which I think mm. I'm pronouncing right. I'm not ba- sure. Balalaika, that's correct. Yeah. There are also now, now, nowadays, there are two Leningrad ladies. Okay. Uh, which is great. Mm. Um, they are kind of a big deal. Like, it's interesting because, like, a lot of people in America don't know who they are. If overseas, they're mm. rather famous. <laughs> and there are different levels of fame. Yeah. The Spice well, Girls I mean, they're, were... They're a Finnish band. And, yeah. True. But, like, the Spice Girls, mm. like, the whole world knew who they were to the point with by the time Spice World came out, some people were ready to move on. Mm. Leningrad Cowboys were so tiny that when you saw them, you couldn't help but love their little adventures, and you want them to go on forever because they were underdogs. That's the kind of the irony of Spice World. They're not underdogs. Mm. They're, we're they're used overdogs. To the, yeah, they're overdogs. They have everything, and we want them to keep it. This is an odd thing to do. It's an odd try to way to tug a, uh, uh, an audience's heartstrings mm. by saying, I hope the, pe- the rich people I keep in business stay rich. Mm. Like... <laughs> It's, it's, isn't it great that we're happy and wealthy? But at the same, but then you have the exact opposite. When a movie which plays very much the same way in every kind of structure and little aside and mm. side little vignette and stupid joke, is a story about a band from Siberia who comes to America, awkwardly learns rock and roll, and eventually achieves mild success in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, the man. plot. It's a great little movie, and no one knows about it. It is on DVD. You can get it uh, from Criterion. Had a, I think they still do the Eclipse series. I think they're still releasing Eclipse. So, so Criterion boxes. Collection is the DVD distribution company that releases all these really quality, amazing art house, important movies, and then they also created an Eclipse series, which was here are movies which are really interesting but don't have enough of an audience that we mm. can dedicate all the time we would normally dedicate to making tons of special features. So, so we're going to put them out for you. They, they, and they put like several of them in a box. And, yeah. and the, the Leningrad Cowboys weren't big enough to really warrant Criterion release, but they're two movies you could put in a box and pay the same price for and still yeah. get this fascinating thing. So it's a readily available. I'm not sure if it's on Filmstruck. I know they have all the Criterion stuff. It might be. Might be. It's yeah. worth checking out. I didn't out. look, but yeah, it might be on Filmstruck. It, it, it's certainly worth looking for. Uh, it's incredibly endearing. It's incredibly funny. If you're looking for something, if you've seen A Hard Day's Night, you've seen The Blues Brothers, you've seen Spice World, you've seen Joseph, but you see, you think you've seen all of mm. these great, funny band movies and you haven't seen Leningrad Cowboys? Boom. You're Let, welcome. Leningrad Cowboys Go America. You will thank us. It's so <laughs> fucking cute. It's a really, really great movie. And I'm glad if one person, one person who listens to this show goes out and watches Leningrad Cowboys Go America... Mm. my life will have been worth it. I, I, it just means we're doing our job correctly. That's, that's, that's what I mean. Mm. I'll take it. <laughs> and it's great to watch back to back with it's Spice World. It's super amazing in every way. <clears throat> um, so uh, that's the main show. Uh, we, I, we are running crazy long. Mm-hmm. It's two hours and 15 minutes, but... <laughs> but we, we love you. But we love you, and you sent us a ton of emails. So let's read two. Two emails. Two today. Okay. We'll uh, hype up while I get these emails up on okay, the screen. Okay, so everybody, uh, don't forget uh, to listen to all the other people on the uh, SK Plus network and the Schmoes Know iTunes feed, depending on how you listen to it. There's a ton of other great podcasts on here. Listen to all of our other friends in the podcasting universe. Linoleum Knife with Dave White and Alonzo Duraldo is one of the best podcasts mm-hmm. ever. Uh, there's a ton of other podcasts out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clark Wolf has a new podcast called uh, Sending the Wolf. Uh, you definitely want to check that out. Um mm-hmm. Just a ton of uh, uh, great content. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at William Bibiani. He's mm-hmm. at Whitney Seibold. Uh, we have another um, podcast called Cancel Too Soon, where we review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. And uh, that's actually appropriate, because we just did Fishing with John, which also has Jim Jarmusch in it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It's a fun little, little, little bit of linking material Also, there. Fishing with John is one of the best shows you've probably mm-hmm. never seen, and you're going to want to listen to that podcast, because it's mm-hmm. really, really fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and we got a whole bunch of stuff coming yeah. up, but let's read, a, let's read an email. Okay, this one comes from Joshua. Hello, Hello. Joshua. Um, hey, Bibbs and Whitney. As an early Christmas gift, could you please review the movie Donnie Darko? It's one of my fam- favorites, yet none of the film podcasts I listen to, which are many, never talk about them. Thanks. Happy holidays from Miami, Florida. Okay. I haven't seen Donnie Darko in a really long time, mm-hmm. but I will tell you what I remember about Donnie Darko. Uh, Donnie Darko uh, is pretty good. 
It's 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 uh, <laughs> that sounds mean. No, Don, Donnie Darko didn't impress me the first time I saw it, actually. And it wasn't until a few years had passed and I went back that I kind of realized kind of how dynamic it really is. There's it's, a lot going on with that movie. That movie is Richard Kelly didn't end up becoming the big, huge, world changing filmmaker. A lot of people thought he would be after Donnie mm-hmm. Darko. But when you look at Donnie Darko as a calling card. That is an impressive first movie. Yeah, He's balancing yeah. so much. Stars Jake Gyllenhaal as this very disenfranchised kid who may be, who may be insane. He started yeah, talking okay. to a creepy talking a rabbit. He's, that he he's, can, only he can see. He's in therapy, and I think he's even on meds. I don't recall if that's mm. a detail. But, uh, yeah, he and he begins getting theories about sort of time travel and how, you know, his, his cynicism is enough to kind of break through the disingenuous... Uh, uh, suburban milieu man. Imagine if and, Holden uh, Caulfield might have superpowers. Yeah, that's a good way. <laughs> that's a pretty good way, good way to look at it. it. There's there's a lot of uh, kind of dated anti uh, suburban sentiment in it. Which well was handled, re- though. really really big in the late '90s. Look at like American Beauty for goodness sake. Yeah. But it's handled better here because it is told from the perspective of a cynical teen who would have that viewpoint. So, yeah, yeah. I, um, I think it's a very skillfully crafted movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it a little emotionally cold for my taste. Taste. Oh, um, I, I I can dig on that coldness, but yeah, I know you can. Yeah. For me, I, I you know, I, I, I it's not my bag mm-hmm. per se, but I think it's certainly a really impressive film. It certainly deserves to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm not gonna. I don't have time to go back and rewatch it right now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, well, I dig Donnie mm-hmm. Darko. It's not my favorite, right. but it's really good. This one comes from Josh. Oh, um, another Josh. Another Josh. Hey, happy holiday, Bibbs and Whitney. Uh, as the superhero genre keeps getting bigger and bigger, with different types of them coming out. Uh, such as horror superhero movies with the new mutants Mm -hmm. and a Western with Logan. Do you think more acclaimed directors would notice this trend and would like to take a chance at it? For instance, Terrence Malick silver surfer movie, (laughs) the silver surfer all alone in the vastness of space. Dreading his immortality. Or a Sofia Coppola Supergirl movie where Richie goes to collars and majors in women's studies. Thanks for asking my question. Um, I think Terrence Malick doing a superhero movie is a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, it's a fun thing to think about. Yeah. And I think Silver Surfer is a good choice for it. It's a very <laughs> contemplative character. Mm. Um, I think when it comes to superhero movies, I, I think two things are going to happen. I think... Um, they're ne- First off, they're never going away. I think we need yeah. to accept that. And, and even like people are like, oh, the Western died. We just had a prominent Western. Yeah, we, yeah. It's never going to go away. It's become a permanent genre mm. where people will always look back to it because it's been at the top of the heap for about 20 years now. Long that's, time. It that's feels a, like a long time. That's a, it's been about, it's been, they've been dominating the box office for about 20 years. And I got to tell you, like if you go back at least to like, you know, the X-Men or whatever mm. and Blade came out in 97, like that was the start like, of that, that, this 90, movement. 98. But yeah. But, but yeah, like a long time. Mm. This is a significant percentage of the history of cinema. Mm. at this point, has been very driven by superhero cinema. Yeah. This is here to stay, at the very least, as an established genre. Mm. Problem is, studios still want to have enormous control over it because it is a franchise that can last forever. And, and it's still making like huge, huge, huge amounts of money. Yeah, so major filmmakers who have a particularly strong artistic vision and are used to, or expect to, be able to drive their own mm. storylines and make their own creative decisions are going to not want to make a lot of superhero movies because all of that freedom is taken away from them. This is why a lot of superhero movies and major franchise movies are given to younger filmmakers who have a lot of promise but haven't necessarily made such a big name for themselves yet yeah, that they yeah. can push anyone around, look at what happened with Han Solo, for example. Yeah, or, or Edgar Wright and Ant-Man, for Exactly. Instance. Like, they just they were not in a position mm. to tell the studio no, no so the studio got someone else uh, I can see a film like a really interesting filmmaker trying to tell a superhero type story with a non-licensed character Unbreakable for instance Super Super James Gunn yeah. great movie um, Griff the Invisible you know there's there's stuff that can be <laughs> thank you for bringing up Griff the Invisible I like that movie a lot <laughs> it's a pretty no good one movie. talks about that one that's a um, good one but yeah there, there's a lot of these things that people are uh, can explore but it's not going to be with the licensed characters that you mm-hmm. want the licensed or, characters or at least not a major license are, are being hoarded by gigantic octopus monsters in Hollywood so mm-hmm. um, yeah you can see Already, certain uh, certain filmmakers trying to explore this notion: What if I had better, you know, better powers? Yeah, and I think the and I think what we're also seeing, especially mm. in like um, 
the X-Men and the Marvel universes, we're starting to see that because these movies are so reliably successful, mm. studios are starting to feel a little bit more comfortable being a little bit more experimental until we get something like Logan, which feels very fresh. Yeah. That's how we get something like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which I wasn't the hugest fan of, but was very odd. Col- colorful and odd. Uh, yeah. More so, I think, Thor Ragnarok kind of hit that spot. For Fair me. enough. Yeah. yeah. So, like, look, we're going to see more experimentation as we move on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think we're ever going to see Terrence Malick do it. Sophia Coppola would make a weird movie. <laughs> I'd kind of like to see that. Here's the thing. I I go to Terrence Malick when I don't want to see superhero movies anymore. Mm-hmm. It's like, I saw a superhero movie. I saw eight of them this year. C- can I see a Terrence Malick I, film instead? Those are relatively short letters. Mm-hmm. Let's read one or two more. All right. Uh, this one's from Nick. Hey, Nick. Hey, guys. <clears throat> I am so glad y'all are back to movie podcasting. Oh, we are, too. And how? Don't get me wrong, I love Cancel Do Soon, but your podcast is one of the ways I keep myself sane when no one I know watches anything outside of the usual Hollywood product. It's nice to hear... Lit- l- Nice to literally hear, sorry, my voice is going a little bit, literally hear people's opinions and enthusiasm on movies like Endless Poetry, which is one of the best movies of the year. Thank you. I've been saying that all year. (laughs) Endless Poetry is great. Um, I'm writing because I would like uh, some film requests. After seeing Lady Bird's nostalgia for the early 2000s Sacramento, I was wondering if there are any films about my home state of Louisiana that portray life here with some verisimilitude. It would be nice if any of them were set outside of New Orleans. Yeah, it's a cool probably. city, but even uh, but a different planet compared to the rest of the state. Even though I still live here, I can't help but feel a one-sidedness to my relationship with film in such regards to depicting culture. I often learn so much about how people in other states and co- countries live, yet I'm sure if those people's only reference for life is life here is the depiction of New Orleans, I see so frequently. I'd be curious to see if y'all could help me find my culture somewhere else in film's history. Well, I mean, it's difficult um, because <sighs> there's a there's a there's if you think about how many movies take place in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, mm. people tend to gravitate towards setting their stories in places that are perceived by outside those places as being wild hubs Colorful of activity. And, dynamic, yeah. and so typically the biggest city in any given state ends up mm. driving that. There, there, there are a lot of films set in Louisiana. I, I, I promise I've only kind of ever been to New Orleans. So well, I can only really kind of speak mm. to that part of the experience. I, mean, I saw the, the great HBO series Treme, yeah. It's all about New Orleans, very specifically. Um, um, but uh, I mean, there's a there's a ton. There's a ton well, of movies. Um, you you are not a here. Louisianian if you have not seen Steel Magnolias. Well, um, you're not a person if you haven't seen. No, I'm kidding. I well, love Steel Magnolias. I actually haven't seen Steel Magnolias. Okay. I'm married to a woman from Louisiana, and that makes me a bad husband. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. So Steel Magnolias, uh, from what I understand, is. Very accurate depiction okay, um, of life in uh, Louisiana. Uh, there's, there's a lot of sort of antebellum gothic horror movies that kind of came yeah, out of Skeleton Louisiana. Key. Skeleton Key. Yeah. But that, that's also New Orleans, though. But I was thinking of Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. Okay. <clears throat> uh, there's uh, here's here's a here's a movie. I was, oh. I was I was just thinking about. I was trying to make sure it wasn't set Louisiana, and it turns out it is. Uh, the Man in the Moon. Coming oh, of the age one with, drama. Uh, Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, there's Man in the Moon with Jim Carrey, which a lot of people are talking about now because there was just this big documentary about the mm-hmm. making of that movie. Uh, but also, The Man in the Moon from 1991 is a very well respected coming of age film starring Reese Witherspoon and one of her biggest. Uh, uh, no, it was her first film debut. Hmm. Correction. Film debut. Oh, nice. um, but that's a movie that everyone who has seen that movie totally loves that movie. Uh-huh. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty good example. Um, I'm trying to think. Eve's Bayou, I think it's in Louisiana. I'm, I'm trying to think of something that's not... Lenny Gray Cowboys go to Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> they do. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something that's like Louis, like outside of the outside of the bayou. And, yeah, because uh, like Southern Comfort's all on the bayou. It's like, fantastic, yeah, all, but it's all not All of those flattering. films are all really like bayou. Um, yeah. If you have, if you haven't seen William Friedkin's film *Bug*, uh, *Bug* is terrific, and mm. it's based on a play, and it stars Ashley Judd and Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon is cl- from the get-go clearly not in his right mind. He's clearly kind of insane, and Ashley Judd falls in love with him nonetheless. She sees him as this very strong character. She has some pretty shady things in the past. She doesn't have access to her son any longer. She's not a happy person, but they find kind of solace in one another, and as the film progresses, we realize that he's giving over to increasingly paranoid fantasies about government conspiracies and how they're sort of spying on him and planting things in his body, and she starts to essentially catch his insanity yeah. and believe the, the the things as well until they're like lining the room with aluminum foil. Yeah. It's it's uh, acting powerhouse for both of them 
and it is tragic and wonderful and really, really accurate about the way mental illness works. And it's set in Louisiana. There <laughs> so, you go. Uh, and not like on the bayou. It's it's more specifically about kind of like mm. these dumpy roadside motels you might see on the road. Yeah. Anyway, we hope that helps. <clears throat> um, let's do one more. We got one more time for one more. One more letter. Okay. Uh, what do we got? Oh, let me call it up here. Um, this one comes from Brian. Hi, Brian. Hello, Brian. Critically acclaimed. Sir. Hello. Uh, just finished your fourth episode of your podcast, and uh, while discussing Biodome, you dropped a reference to Puppet Master. <laughs> I'm a big fan of this movie series and the other movies Charles Band created. Uh, I spent many a week renting his current releases in the 90s. Didn't we all? Oh, we all went through that phase. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to suggest the Puppet Master series by Charles Band as your end of the month series to re- uh, review show. If you just des- <clears throat> if you decide to do this show, please discuss the Charles Band genre movies he created in the 1990s, Brian. Uh, that's definitely something <clears throat> we're going to put on that well, list because you've if, seen all but like the most recent one right uh i think the recent two i think they've made two since i i you, you got through yeah. axis of evil which is the 10th yeah and i think, there were uh, well, two I, think I think numerically the 10th although technically it's like the 11th or 12th like actual film well because there's because some is demonic to- is versus demonic toys canon who knows anymore yeah i don't think it technically counts as canon but i, I watched it anyway i don't think most of them count as canon i've seen enough to know that oh. they play pretty fast and loose with their own mythology <laughs> and for those who don't know uh charles band created a low budget mostly horror movie mm. studio called full, full moon, moon. Yeah. and uh they are again they're low budget horror movies many of them are about for whatever reason tiny monsters yeah, so the that, Ghoulies, if you ever saw that cover of a movie called Ghoulies, a little green monster in the toilet, mm-hmm. that's Charles Band. He did the Puppet Master movies, which is about marionettes that come alive and kill people. The first two were pretty good. The, first the two other pretty 83 good. are kind of crap. <laughs> He did well, four and five were shot back to he back. He did demonic toys. Mm-hmm. He did doll man. He did doll man versus demonic toys. There's also some kind of neat weird stuff he did. He did uh, the Oblivion series, which was space cowboys. Yeah, yeah, which is actually I think Peter David wrote one or both of those. Peter David's a famous uh, comic uh, book comic author, writer. Wrote a bunch of Star Trek novels as well. Those are actually pretty good. Um, so like, well, yeah, I, I would also encourage you. We interviewed Charles Band. We yeah. went to his office. We went to the Full Moon offices in, in downtown Los Angeles and talked to him for a little bit. It was cool. He was, he was a cool guy. He's totally a businessman. You know, he's, yeah. he's not terribly interested in the aesthetics of film. Yeah. But uh, he's been doing it long enough that he cares. He, he clearly cares. He cares. And he, he yeah. knows a good film from a bad film and he knows what, it, what will sell. And uh, yeah, he's he's very, very frank about uh, sort of operating full moon and what his inter- where his interests lie. Uh, that was part of the B-Movies podcast. And I think that's still alive That one somewhere. might still be available yeah. if you can track that down. A lot of those episodes have gone away. It's and, true, and really. some of them will, will n- never be seen again. I, I and think that's that, fine. I think honestly. a lot of them are still on iTunes. I think they're just no longer on the Crave Online site. You'll you'll have to, if you want to look, you can. I honestly don't encourage you for most of it. Some of the interviews are really great, though, and definitely the Charles Band one is one yeah, of my more. Yeah. It's one of my happier moments. <laughs> I got to get Charles. Well, Band when we got Charles story. Band and David Dakota in like rapid succession, that was, that cool. was pretty cool. I think David, didn't David Dakota help us get Charles Band? He did. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Uh, Char- <laughs> David Dakota directed two or three of the Puppet Master movies. He directed so. some of the better ones, like three, he directed the. Uh, Puppet Master 3, which is probably my favorite. Uh, like, it's the one that, that's the best regarded, anyway. 2 is my favorite. Yeah, it's the, uh, yeah. the origin of the of the dolls and how they were actually created to kill Nazis, and so it's actually kind of kind of fun and pulpy and weird. And there's a reason why Blade looks like Richard Lynch. Turns out he was modeled on Richard Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so that's that's can- uh, canceled too soon. That's critically acclaimed. It's the other podcast. <laughs> canceled too soon is our other podcast. But if you want to email us, you can email us critically acclaimed fans at gmail.com. Unfortunately, based on you know obviously time constraints, everything, we don't tend to get to every single letter, but we're trying to get to as many as we can. Yeah. And it's been a really long episode, and hopefully next week won't be quite as long because uh, uh, we'll mm. try to burn through our best of the year a little quicker. Yeah, than, uh, yeah. than we've been doing. Um, but uh, we will have another poll, and you can go to the Schmoville Facebook page right now, and you can vote for, since that episode will be coming out on Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. a notorious Christmas movie. Hooray! So you get to tell us that we have to review one of the following films. Christmas with the Cranks, starring Tim Allen as a guy who's a crank at Christmas. He's, his, their daughter moved away. They don't want to celebrate Christmas anymore. Based on the novel by John Grisham. Weird I'm stuff. I'm not kidding. <laughs> All right. We've got Elves. If you don't know the movie Elves, 
I'm going to tell you right now. Familiarize yourself a little bit. Elves is pretty special. Elves is the room of Christmas horror movies. It stars uh, Grizzly Adams. Yes, it does. As a, uh, an alcoholic mall Santa uh, who has with, to do battle. With one with, elf. With one elf. It's not called elves. elves. <laughs> Just one. An elf who was or a rather, Nazi experiment. Or rather, he has to do battle with a really bad elf puppet. And yeah. Uh, and yeah, which it's was a, the result of Nazi, it, it, Nazi Christmas Nazi experiments. Experiments. It's amazing. Elves. It's terrible. And I... I I dread oh, having so to watch it bad. again, but it's pretty damned amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jingle All the Way, a movie you're probably familiar with, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger as a dad who forgot to get his son the most pow- popular toy for Christmas mm-hmm. and goes out on Christmas Eve and gets in all kinds of wacky shenanigans with Sinbad. Put that cookie down. Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. <laughs> Oh my god, I've only, I, if you, I, you know you're going to make me watch that one again, aren't you? I've only heard the legends, I've not seen it. <sighs> it's... I don't even... It's going to be a lot of me stammering trying to find words. Because, man, (laughs) that one's tough. And then, finally, Santa Claus the Movie. Not not the Santa Claus with Tim Allen. No, Santa Claus the Movie, which is a movie that was a big deal when it came out in the 80s. People didn't care for it very much, and it's kind of fallen into obscurity. But it's a big-budget movie about Santa Claus... Dudley Moore gets fired from the from the factory. He's an elf. He goes to work with a massively overacting John Lithgow to try to compete with so, Santa for Christmas supremacy. So John Lithgow. In other John words. Lithgow. <laughs> it was a huge movie. It's no one talks about it anymore. It, it, I, I've, I've heard that it's terrible. I haven't seen it since I was like four. It was a. I, I, it, it, it was one of those films like Howard the Duck that was like hu- talked about in hushed tones around Hollywood as like one of the worst ideas and like one of the biggest bombs that, to come out of the decade. Um, let's find out. <laughs> Let's see how it is. If you vote if for you it. If you vote for it. So we'll you can go to the Schmelville Facebook page. The poll is up right now. You can check that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, next week, we will be back. We'll probably review The Greatest Showman since uh, the embargo wasn't up. Yeah. So we couldn't review it this week. It but we'll also be talking about, in addition to reviewing the Christmas movie of your choice and a better Christmas movie to, to pair or, it with. Or just whatever appropriate thing we can pair with it. Probably a Christmas Perhaps movie. Perhaps a Christmas movie. Uh, we're also going to be talking about our picks for the best films of 2017. And we have darn good taste. I hope so. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise, we should be doing something else. My list is going to disappoint every single person. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's right. it, my number one's been up there for a while, so this should oh, be okay. interesting. Nothing's quite come close, but there's a lot of really, really great films that came out this year, so mm. that'll be a lot of fun. So uh, join us in one week. Thank you, everybody. For listening, again, uh, follow us on Twitter at William Bibiani at Whitney Seibold. Email us can- uh, critically acclaimed fans at gmail.com. Listen to all of our other Schmoes No and Schmo SK Plus uh, shows. And uh, yeah, never forget, everyone's a critic. I want to go to the midnight show. I'm sorry, what?